Sporting Center. I didn't know we were going to have this Christmas. What do you want to do? That's the thing.
top one or two. Father, we praise you for the season of love as we enter the season of Advent and Hanukkah that begins today. We know that evil exists today and throughout time. Unfortunately, not everything reflects your love and grace. Man often chooses evil and goes a destructive path. We ask you this morning to protect the nation of Israel and help us to always be their ally. Also on this day, we remember a time of great evil in our world. On that fateful Sunday morning, 82 years ago, evil attacked Pearl Harbor. We remember and honor the 2,400 American heroes that lost their lives that morning. Nearly half were on USS Arizona, and over 400 sailors, sailors and Marines on USS Oklahoma. Over 1,100 were wounded on that fateful day. We remember the two young men, Paul Free and Billy Brandt, from Lycoming County, that died as heroes. Their memories, along with these other Americans who paid the ultimate sacrifice, will never be forgotten. This attack led to the greatest generation who stood their ground and defended our freedom. You gave them the courage and bravery to fight evil. Let us always honor them by protecting our freedoms for future generations. We ask you to protect our troops throughout the world. As we remember Pearl Harbor and witness the evil that is evident today, let us pray for peace. May we remember your love and share it not only during this season, but throughout the year. We ask you for your guidance throughout the meeting. These things we humbly pray in your name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd also uh, like to add to his prayer that we pray for the uh, innocent Palestinians as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner seeking Hang on a second. At this time, we'll convene the Commissioner's public meeting and ask for approval of minutes, previous minutes of the previous min, minutes move. of the previous meeting. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Director. All right, Commissioner Knapp, seeking uh, your approval to add an informational item 4.1, Senator Gene Yard, Historic Preservation. Mr. Chairman, I'll move to add to the agenda the presentation by Senator Yaw. I'll second that motion. All fair side? Aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Do we have public comment on agenda <coughs> items only at this time? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to reports. Kayla? Good morning, Commissioners. Presented for your ratification are invoices due through December 13th, 2023, to be paid on December 6th for $1,777,273. The breakdown is as follows, with 50.13% being funded by the general fund at $890,860.48. 9.16% is being funded by ARPA grants at $162,736.08. 29.36% is being funded by Act 13 grants at $521,822. 2.75% being funded by pass-through monies and other grants at $48,817.52. 6.05% is being funded by RMS 
at $107,440.28. And 2.57% is being funded by escrow at $45,596.64. Okay. Motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Comments or questions? I was going to say, I see the, the largest chunk of our Act 13 is going out to the old city project that we had approved <coughs> previously. Okay. Motion to approve. Next, I have presented for your ratification is the polling places pay run to be paid on December 6th. 2023 for $39,750. This is funded 100% through the general fund. We have motion. I move to approve the house second. Holder's side. Aye. 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 And lastly, I have presented for your ratification is a special check run for Holton Contracting for construction of the new roof. This is set for payment on November 30th, 2023 for $59,875. And this is funded 100% through the general fund. Motion. I'll move to approve. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. All right, moving on to information items 4.1. Senator Young. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. It's great to be here. And um, I look at the agenda item, a historic presentation, and uh, anymore I get to the point of every time I see historic and it's my name, I think that, oh, okay, they're looking at me to tell what really happened somewhere along the line. Uh, so in keeping, I don't want to violate the agenda, so I will say a couple of things about a couple of historic things. Number one, I, I know that the commissioners recently and, and, and Commissioner Massar has uh, been very, very active in acquiring the land at the landfill, the 1,000 acres. I was the county solicitor for a number of years, and according to my rough calculations, it only took 30 years to get that, to make it happen. So congratulations and thank you. I worked on that. I, I mean... 25 years ago or 30 years ago and it finally came to pass and it is a major accomplishment for the Lycoming County. That's one thing. The other historic note, uh, for those of you who don't know or remember, this used to be a restaurant. I'm not sure how many of you ever remember that, but it was. Shabash I see a couple of people are shaking their head. That's the name of it, Shabashians. Well, in yeah, and, any and event. Okay, so I feel fulfilled the requirement on the agenda. <laughs> what I'm really here for, uh, and I, I told my staff I really wish I was here for public comment because I wanted to uh, tell uh, Commissioner Massar and Commissioner Marabito that I was really tired of them coming to me and always complaining so I wanted to complain to them during a public session about, uh, you know, my feeling. They always come and they say, we need more money. That's always, you know, that's the first words out of any elected official. Uh, we need more money, uh, unfunded mandate. I don't know what some of the other things are that, you know. And I wanted to say that, look, I want to come and complain because, as uh, Commissioner Marabito said, this is probably maybe his last meeting. So in any event, I wanted to do that, but my staff and, and your staff moved me up on the agendas to the historic preservation presentation. I'm sorry, not preservation. Uh, the reason I'm really here is to recognize the two uh, commissioners that are retiring. And it's a, it, it is a big deal when somebody spends so much time in public office and retires and to my knowledge, they haven't been charged with any problem or anything like that. So it's a, that right off the bat is a congratulation. So I would like to start off, I have a couple of citations, uh, and I would like to start off with the, the senior commissioner, uh, Tony Massara. 
Whereas the Senate of Pennsylvania is always pleased to recognize those individuals who, through their laudable tenure of service, contribute to the meaning in a meaningful way toward the well-being of their communities and this Commonwealth. And whereas Tony R. Massar uh, is being honored upon his retirement from the Lycoming County Board of Commissioners after a career spanning 36 years of dedicated service, and whereas a graduate of the Winsport Area Community College, Mr. Massar has served as Vice President of Armed Services, Inc. since 1987, and he also owns a real estate business with his sons, Anthony and John. A member of the Lycoming County Board of Commissioners since 2012, he currently serves as Vice Chair of the Board. Under his leadership, the Board completed numerous community improvement projects, including the hiring of a management firm to turn the White Deer Golf Course into a profitable operation, acquiring more than 1,000 acres of property from the Federal Bureau of Prisons to expand landfill operations, introducing a bundled bridge program to replace 14 structurally deficient bridges, forming a team of non-federal sponsors to address deficiencies in the Winsport levy system, and partnering with the Chamber of Commerce to bring new businesses to the area. Additionally, Mr. Massar, was instrumental to the establishment of the Lycoming County Partnership Health Center. Throughout his career, he has striven to adhere to the highest standards of service and has rightly earned the respect and admiration of his many friends and colleagues. Now, therefore, the Senate of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania recognizes Tony R. Massar for his years of loyalty and service, proudly notes that he has demonstrated extraordinary commitment to the Lycoming County Board of Commissioners offers best wishes for continued success in the years to come and directs that a copy of this document sponsored by myself be transmitted to him. I have the formal citation here and I don't know how you want to do it. You want to do the both and then we'll, you want to do photo ops or whatever. I'm at your, what do you like to do, Mr. Chairman? Whatever they prefer. Listen, as long as you continue with those comments, you have the all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we also have uh, the other retiring commissioner, uh, Commissioner Marabito, and uh, we have a citation for him also, which is as follows. Whereas the Senate of Pennsylvania is always pleased to recognize those individuals who through their laudable tenure of service contribute in a meaningful way toward the well-being of their communities and this Commonwealth. And whereas the Honorable Richard Marabito, a former member of the House of Representatives of Pennsylvania, is being honored upon his retirement from the Lycoming County Board of Commissioners after a career spanning more than 33 years and Whereas a 1974 graduate of North Shore High School, Mr. Marabito earned a bachelor's degree from Cornell University in 1978 and a Juris Doctorate degree from the Boston College of Law in 1989. <clears throat> Excuse me. Formerly employed as a court counsel for the Republic of Palau. Is that correct? Supreme Court and as a law clerk in the United States District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. He has owned several businesses over the past 25 years. To his great credit, Mr. Marabito was elected to the House of Representatives of Pennsylvania in 2008 and served the 83rd Legislative District for three consecutive terms. A member of the Lycoming County Board of Commissioners since 2016, he was instrumental in the establishment of the Lycoming County Partnership Health Center with Integrity Health and served on the county's conservation district, library, election, prison, law enforcement, emergency management, and emergency management boards. A co-founder and past president of the Greater Williamsport Landlord Association, Mr. Barabito is also a member of the Fire Tree Place Board and St. Boniface uh, Catholic Church, and a life member of the J.B. Brown Library Board. Now, therefore, the Senate of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania recognizes the Honorable Richard Marabito for his years of loyalty and service and proudly notes that he 
has demonstrated extraordinary commitment to Lycoming County, offers best wishes for continued success in the years to come, and directs that a copy of this document sponsored by myself be transmitted to him. So to both of you, congratulations. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's been an honor from my perspective to serve with uh, a board of commissioners as responsive and responsible as this board and the two of you have been over the years. So. Well, thank With you, that. Senator. I think we are both very surprised, and not—I mean, we really appreciate it, but it was totally un, un uh, expected. We thought you were going to talk about historic <laughs> preservation, maybe preserving <laughs> that stuff. But uh, we well, that was, that was the setup with your staff here, so yeah, yeah. We're trying to figure out how to put on the agenda without you two knowing about it. Uh, uh, well, it was yeah. really, really considerate of all of you, and we we really appreciate it, both staff of your office and Senator and, and our staff. It, it really, I think, means a lot to us. Sure. Usually we're on the other end of giving out the citations. Let's go on. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I kind of 
just plow through it and keep going and you know and hopefully accomplish something that's the goal so all right thanks thank senator you. thanks thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank, thank you, you. Senator. congratulations thank you. we really do thank you okay moving on we have uh, step group with us so we shall have it some exciting news <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, actually, so we are <clears throat> uh, really happy to announce that we're coordinating with CEDACOG for the rollout of the whole home program in Lycoming County. So Lycoming County uh, has um, provided us a recipient <coughs> to um, CEDACOG, and we are going to be contracting with them to help CEDACOG execute the program. Um, and just a little bit of background, the whole home program was a rollout um, as it relates to housing, rehabilitation, <coughs> health and safety as well as training and so those are the components of the program we currently are going to be utilizing the existing waiting list that we have which is over 600 people in Lycoming County um, that are on the list for housing rehab energy efficiency safety uh, and health and so those are um, where we're going to start the process we have the process in place we're actually doing this process in uh, Clinton County and have them already have that operational. I'd like to introduce my staff that are going to be working on this project. We have Nate Snook, who's our housing director, and Raylan Jackson, who's our service navigation director. One of the key things about this program is the homeowners will be able to have access to full case management for the full family and to move them to self-sufficiency through this process. So really excited about this, uh, really excited to get this underway in Lycoming County. It's taken a long time. Um, but very happy that, that we're going to be doing this. Um, I'll turn it over to Joel from CEDACOG. One of the key things is that CEDACOG is going to be managing the, sub, the uh, subcontracts. Um, so we're going to be doing the, the eligibility, um, the audits, and then actually kind of handing that work plan or the scope of work over to CEDACOG, who's going to be managing the subcontractors. Um, so if there are any subcontractors, I'm sure Joel would like to know who they are, because uh, that's one of the key pieces of this program. If you have any subcontractors or contractors, um, housing contractors that are interested in this kind of work, um, there is a couple requirements. They have to be licensed and, um, right, licensed yes. and insured. insured. Yep. Yeah. So they have to be licensed and insured. So uh, really excited. I do have a just a little press release that talks about the program, so I'll leave one, one each with um, each of your commissioners, and then I'll provide one back to the Sun Gazette. Uh, and yeah, really excited about this, this program and willing to take any questions the commissioners may have before I turn it over to Joel. Yeah, I don't know whether you or Joel, but could you just for the public mention who's eligible, what just rough qualifications so people who are listening or who read about it can understand whether or not they can access it. Yeah, so the, the funding is um, income-based, and so there is an eligibility criteria. Um, the exact number is 80% 80 80 of area median income, which is, I don't know exactly off the top of my head. Of course, you're going to throw me a... No, no, that's 80% okay. of, of area median, median income. Household yes. income? Household income, yes. So, so we usually throw around the number of about 54,000 per area. Jenny, uh, Jenny, you would. Oh, I don't know. Well, usually fifty-four thousand is the median household income, yes. roughly. So eighty percent of that, you're looking at like eight times five is thirty, maybe uh, another two, thirty-two. Eight times five is forty. Eight times five is forty. Yeah. Times five is 40. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> it might be, yeah, fifty-two. So you're looking at around forty for okay. So there are going to be a lot of people eligible. Yes, and I think the key to this program is, is that we've already had, we have a, a home, an unmet needs waiting list, and so that is about 600 people right now in Lycoming County. Those are individuals that have called or contacted us within the last, I would say, couple years. We do kind of go through the list to make sure the individuals are still habiting those houses and, you know, available for that service. So we are going to start at the top of that list, but there is an interest sheet if anybody wants to continue to get on that list. And so if you're unsure if you're already on that list, you know, definitely give us a call. If you want to get on that list, you know, we can definitely get you on that list, but we will be starting at the top of the list and working down based on eligibility. Is there an age requirement? There is no age requirement. No age, okay. And the, the other, Joel, do you mind if I talk about the workforce piece? So the other key component of this, which is really exciting, and I don't think we have anybody here from Penn College, 
um, is that the Penn College Clean Energy Center uh, is going to be working on a workforce component for this because we all know that it is very challenging to get construction laborers as well as construction supervisors. I know uh, within the field it's very challenging to find individuals who are capable and able to be able to do the work um, such as rehab and construction and those kind of things. So they are going to be doing two cohorts uh, in Lycoming County at their facility, which would be, which it would include kind of the on the site training in their facilities. They have labs that actually do the work there, and then actually on the job training with actual contractors. The idea was that these cohorts, so there's going to be two done, one in the summer of 2024 and one in the summer of 2025, um, about 10 ish individuals that will get the full training to be able to essentially after they walk out that door um, they will be completely employable on any contractor level the hope is is that through that program many of them will be uh, become staff of agencies such as ours agencies such as CEDACOG and other construction private construction firms within the community as well um, so this is a really exciting kind of uh, best practice is what the state is looking at it as um, really looking at it as an innovative way to get some individuals, particularly maybe students who are in those construction specialties already in high school as a scholarship to be able to move them to Penn College, go through this training program, and then really be rapidly employed. So really excited about that piece. So It's a big deal. It's a big deal because it's also the funds for it are coming from from FAIR, the Pennsylvania, no. No, ARPA. ARPA, yeah. Oh, ARPA, ARPA. 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 okay. Well, that's real. That's really good. Because I hope the community understands the significance of it, because we have a problem with labor shortage, right? Yes. So this is an opportunity for us to train young people, get them working, as well as keeping people in their homes, both yes. seniors and uh, and other folks. And I think that the key to this funding is this is the first year this funding is available, with the hope that it'll eventually become a year-round like a, a actual allocation within the budget. Um, so in the future that will actually uh, help complement the FAIR funding programs and the other housing programs that the commissioners already um, already do. And so this is just an alternative funding source, really kind of focused on um, individuals within Lycoming County who are homeowners, focus on that health and safety. It is not full code compliance, which is different than CDBG, um, but it provides that habitability, energy efficiency, health and safety. So really excited uh, to be a part of this um, and really appreciate the commissioners and CEDACOG allowing us to partner. So I'll turn it over to Joel if you want to. What else can I say? <laughs> uh, she's pretty much covered everything that we have. I am the CEDACOG Rehab Manager, Housing Rehab Manager. Um, we are going to do basically putting the jobs out. Once they create the write-ups, the specs, uh, we will be providing the contractors and doing walkthroughs and awarding to those contractors. Uh, and then when it comes time for somebody to be paid, we will also be doing that. Um, it is for low income, uh, and you know that is a big thing. It's a big problem, not only in Lycoming County, but pretty much all over PA. Uh, I work in Lycoming County in South Williamsport and Jersey Shore now at present with our housing rehab program. So we are hoping that we can get the contractors around. We have an RFP out, and we'll make this work. Did every community get these funds? There was three communities that did not accept the funds from the county level, and those funds were redistributed into the counties that actually asked for the funds. Yeah. And so this is a county allocation that's based on population and square mileage of your your territory. Yeah. So one of the things that we're fortunate is to have both STEP and, and CEDACOG to be able to do the coordination. If you're in a county and you don't have those resources, then you're trying to figure out as a county commissioner, how are we going to deal with the day-to-day -day implementation of that program? And that's we appreciate that. that. The, the other thing I should mention is that, that the, there is an interest form on our website. So if you are interested, <coughs> Um, you know, anybody out there, you can do the interest form right on your we our website. You can get on the list that way. Um, there are other housing programs that we are offering, so feel free to check out the website, um, stepcorp.org, if there's interest in housing programs there. I concur with my colleague, uh, Commissioner Maravito, and uh, we found out this week or uh, 
the end of last week that uh, my colleague here, Scott Metzger, is going to be the president of, of CEDACOC. And, and I was going to announce that under Commissioner Comet. I am sorry. No, that's your <laughs> point. We should, we should, no, seriously, we this is... the punch. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I had a note here. Um, but no, it's, it's very important, and we congratulate him for that. I mean, it's important for our county because it means that he's going to be at the head of an organization of nine, 11, 11 <coughs> counties in the region. Yeah. And it is. So thank you for yes, bringing it up. You. And it's, it is a big deal. I yes. mean, they, they obviously have uh, a lot of respect for Commissioner Metzger and his dedication to our community and his input. So thank you. Commissioner Metzger also sits on the step board of the Right. <laughs> and you guys do fantastic work. Thank you. Yeah, just what you did with the ERAP program. $15 million went out to pay utilities and rents. And, and uh, what a huge undertaking of you and your staff. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, this new program is, and that's one of the programs that you're going to try to fit in with the gentleman down in uh, Muncie, right? Oh no, we have a different program. We've already. Oh, you do. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, awesome. Yeah, the application already went out. I believe so. So we're good. He just needs to send it back. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And someday we may have you back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Some more exciting news under informational services. We have Indigo Golf here. We're strand. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, everyone. Uh, White Deer had a quite tremendous season in 2023, and so I wanted to kind of come up here and just kind of give a little recap of kind of where we've been, as well as uh, kind of this season. But first and foremost, I really need to thank the Commissioners for your dedication to White Deer. Um, that's been instrumental in our financial viability that we've now created for the past uh, for the past quite few seasons. So. 2023 had both record revenue and record bottom line um, to for White Deer this year. We had great rounds, obviously some solid weather throughout the year, um, but overall a great season um, that hit record revenues. This also marks our sixth consecutive season uh, of being fully self-sustaining. Uh, so, which also includes all our self-funded projects, clubhouse, irrigation, driver range, cart paths, maintenance equipment, uh, the new cart fleet that we just got a few years ago. All that obviously has helped to our success um, and keep the golf course viable and keep our patrons coming back year after year. Speaking of the new cart fleet, we just made our third full payment on that. So that was over $55,000 uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and in 2024, we'll continue to self-fund and take care of the golf course and the improvements that are needed. Lastly, um, with this continued success, um, we're actually I'm here today to present Lycoming County with a check, kind of as some funds back to the county um, for you know helping us obviously to get started. Um, but now going forward, we're able to kick some money back to the county from the profits we're making at the golf course. Um, the golf course come a long way over the last um, eight seasons that we've been involved with it. And we appreciate the support of all our golfers, members, outings, <coughs> Lycoming County as a whole, and ultimately the commissioners for, for supporting us and uh, you know making this a true asset to the county. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. I have a nice big old check. That's awesome. Thirty-five thousand. Back to the county. Sure, you all have a little bit to say about this. <laughs> yeah, thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> So, 
this is a significant event. And I say that because some of you may not golf. I don't golf. But this isn't about golfing. It's about how do we rebuild a community where population has declined over the last 20 years, where people are not moving here. How do we create a community where people of different types come here and want to live here? So it isn't about golf. It's about rebuilding a community. And the important part is that we're trying to rebuild it in a way that is positive on both the revenue side and positive on the community side. So when he says that it's the second year of being able to sustain themselves, we've spent a lot of money over the years, and there were a lot of dedicated people who were trying to deal with the issues at the golf course. But the point is that we're at a place now where the golf course is able to bring in the revenue to pay all the capital improvements it needs to pay, pay for the staff, and we create an asset that when someone is looking for a community to park themselves in, they may decide to come here. Nobody does, not all of us do the same things, right? We all do different things, but that's why we're trying to support things like the ball fields and this and the library because different strokes for different folks, but hopefully the goal is that we build a community where people want to come. We have to get the population up. Getting the population up stimulates the housing market and spreads a tax base over more people. Not because we want to tax people, because it costs money to run government. That's a reality. It costs money to run a prison. It costs money to run a 911 center. It costs money to plow roads, to have police, to have fire departments. So, and, and I want to hats off to Commissioner Messer, because he, he really has spearheaded the, uh, you know, when I came in, I, I, I knew what I had heard from people in the community who said to me, when you become a commissioner, close the golf course, right? And so, you know, you try as an elected official to examine a problem from all sides. And Commissioner Messer, uh, you know, is a golfer, so he was intimately knowledgeable, but he also had the commitment and the dedication to say, hey, guys, to Jack McKernan and myself, and then later to Commissioner Metzger, don't, don't, uh, don't close the golf course. We thank Indico, which, which we did a competitive bid, and Indico was selected from a competitive bid. And, um, you know, it's, we meet with them once a month, or we used to meet once a month, we meet, yeah, it's about once a month. We get a report, we go down to the course, but uh, I just want the public to try to understand the context, the bigger context in which this is. We are basically taking revenue, look, the golf course belongs to the people of Lycoming County. So now what we is, we have an asset that's actually producing enough revenue to put back money, to pay back money that over the years we've spent. 35000 this year, next year a little more, hopefully. We also need people to use the golf course. You know, we need people to use it. And we're trying to expand it to become more of a family-oriented place, not just for golfers. And we've had some success with that. So I'll let my colleagues speak, but I, just, I, I think it's a good thing that we can feel good about it. I did owe my colleagues remark. Um, it wasn't easy in the beginning. Uh, we've had some conversations and placed a lot of uh, demands on it. At that time, Billy cast the ball. And, but we made it through. And uh, you did a tremendous job, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. Indigo, and, um, what was it? Billy Casper, Indigo, and now Trent. Right. Um, but it does make a difference when you have somebody or an organization you know how to run it. Okay? And uh, our membership uh, at that time was, you know, they were suspect. They were you know, starting <coughs> to lead to the other <coughs> car golf courses. And uh, you made a commitment, you stuck with it, and, and you didn't have much of a budget. But you did what you said you could do, and you turned it around. And I, I believe that they, Chris was, uh, wanting to give us a little bit more money, uh, but but we you know we know that weather can change, sure. and uh, we want you to continue that you know improvements. Uh, I, I hope to see something new and exciting in the next few years that uh, will bring back a lot more members uh, or, or future uh, new members. Sure. And um, I wish you all the luck in the world.
Appreciate that. Thank you. We want to thank you again. Um, you know, one of the things when I ran the first time around, I heard was, you know, white years of golf, golf courses and money pit. And it's bleeding the taxpayers. And it has to stop. And I heard that on so many doors when I knocked. <coughs> that was one of the, the main topics. And uh, through the diligent efforts of this board and the previous board, we stayed the track. We stayed the course. No pun intended. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's great to see, because my concern was, making sure that we have an asset in the community that isn't subsidized by government every year. And we have to get away from that, that mindset of our assets. And um, so it was good to see that it got turned around and, and Commissioner Massar is right. You guys did offer to give us a little bit more out of your bank account, but we felt that, you know, keep it in the rainy day fund in case you do have those rainy sure. days. Um, but it's nice to see some of it come back. Uh, also, the, your obligation to the golf carts. Paid the third of eight payments. Uh, you're honoring that, that agreement, and uh, so really, it's it's basically eighty-five thousand or eighty eighty thousand oh, dollars. Well, ninety grand 90 just yes. that we just paid between right. the two. Yeah, yeah. and two hundred and twenty-five thousand over the last three two years, really, between car payments and other kickbacks to the county. Yeah, and I believe you did give the check previously. It was either for twenty or twenty-five. 25. Yeah, twenty-five. So um, it's nice to see that going back towards uh, debt that was incurred by the. Or so the years. So yeah. thank you and, and we look forward to much more success. But it's on the right track and the main thing it's not costing the taxpayers. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun and, and you know it was very tough at the beginning. There's no joke about we that. Man. <laughs> no. But uh, it's come a long way. It's been a great success story on everyone's part. So it's it's fun yeah. to be involved in and I uh, appreciate again you, know, you guys kind of sticking with us and and getting through those tough times, and the meetings are a lot more fun nowadays. So I'll just say that, right? Versus uh, those first few years. So, uh, yeah, it's great to see the success overall. And we're still staying in the course of, of making sure that two courses are there, but developing the land around it. Uh, you know, we'll continue to work with the uh, National Department of Forestry, getting the conversion over so that we can uh, put that acreage up for sale and you know, hopefully bring some more homes into the area, maybe some future golfers. Coming into uh, okay. their backyard, so we look forward to that. Uh, hopefully, happening within this next administration. Yeah, Everybody people will retire to a community where they can play golf, and, and we can we we need retirees with disposable income to come here so that they can support all the other small businesses. Keep that check next year. You can white out to twenty three, <laughs> thirty five, make it bigger. Uh, yeah, make it bigger. sounds great. Okay, thank you. Lastly. Commissioner Sarah Chris Mario, congratulations. It's been an honor working with you both over the past eight years. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Well, we've enjoyed it. And your staff. Thank you. Should you. Introduce. Thank you. Justin, you want to introduce Justin? Yeah. The Justins are, Justin Dahin is our uh, general manager there. He's been there for the last three seasons, doing a great job and keeping pushing this in the right direction. So and it's, it's been a pleasure system. working with you guys. Thank you for everything. Yeah. And thank, thank you for being accommodating and welcoming. And couldn't have asked for a better group of guys to, to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to stay for the rest of the year. Moving on to personnel action. Morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, asking for approval for the following personal actions um, is conditional offers of employment subject to su uh, successful completion of the background check and other employment conditions. Pre release um, center, Tom <coughs> Tamborelli. He is a driver part-time placement, 1810 per hour, not to exceed 1,000 hours in a year. Start date would be December 11th. Pre-release center, Stephen Mariano, resident supervisor, full-time re um, replacement, 1810 per hour, 80 hours per pay period, and he would start December 18th, 2023. For the prison, we have Alexandra Medker, Corrections Officer 1, Relief, Full-Time Replacement, 1810 per hour, 80 hours per pay, start date December 24th. For the courts, we have Genevieve Lannon uh, as a bailiff, Part-Time Replacement, 1368 per hour, not to exceed 1,000 hours in a year. Transfer date would be December 24th, 2023. District Attorney's Office, Thomas Ungard, Chief County Detective, 
full-time replacement. Um, his yearly salary is $70,965.18 per year. It's 75 hours per pay period. His start date would be December 11th, 2023. And for the courts, Tanya Smith, Administrative Specialist for MDJ's um, Mr. Whiteman's office, full-time replacement, $18.26 per hour, 75 hours per pay period. Um, the transfer date would be December 10th, 2023. Thank you. One motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All here, sorry. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to action items. 6.1 and 6.2, Tony Collins. See you, Kyle. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I have for you today the approval, um, for your approval, the Professional and Administrative Services Agreement with CEDACOG, between Lycoming County and CEDACOG, um, in the amount of $125,800. This is the 20, for the 2022 CDBG funds. Uh, this is a four-year contract, and um, this is taken from the grant itself. Okay, okay. motion. I move to approve. I'll second. And for your approval as well, the uh, it's an amendment to the Professional and Administrative Services Agreement um, from 2021, the CDBG funds. This is to remove um, compliance fees uh, in the amount of $3,900 from the Brook Street project. That was a force account project, so those um, fees can be removed from that PSA. I move to approve. Second. Second. Okay, sorry. Aye. 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 So, okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Kristen, are you on the line? She has other items on the 14th. Perhaps we could just combine it. Okay. We can move it to the 14th. Motion to the table. Do you, want to, you don't want to just pass it? Or? It, All right. It's to completely up to you what you would want to do, but I know she has multiple I items. mean, do we have the written document here? Yeah, it's right there. You do, yeah. There? Maybe Matt can just read it. Okay. And we'll get it. Okay. It may help. She may yeah, yeah. be counting on it. Okay. okay. All right, Commissioner, seeking your approval to amendment number two to the sub-recipient agreement with the West Branch Regional Authority. These are Harper funds. Looks like we're increasing the amount based on the approval we did on September 21st. Right. So this must be the written documentation of the action we took on September 21st. Correct, yes. Okay. We're adding the uh, Trump line. Trump line, good. Yep. We previously approved. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All for sorry. Aye. Aye. Commissioner, seeking your proposal on the proposal with Park Terrace Impact Investors, LLC, 2023 budgeted funds are available. Um, we're going to make a motion uh, to table this, but we see a lot of people in the uh, audience here that I'm sure want to make a comment. I'm not sure if the, the chairman will allow yeah, do you want to make it, first of all, um, if you want to make a motion to table, go ahead and make your motion. And then we'll have to have a second. Well, and then we'll have can to, we do a quick executive session? And, and then if you request an executive session, we can do five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. To discuss legal matters? Yeah. Yeah, th we, we can make it pretty quick. Okay. okay. So we'll adjourn at this time for an executive session.
years in college. Yeah. My first day back in Oh, yeah. So I got big picture here. This is a fund that invests in qualified opportunity zones. And that's as a result of the tax act that was passed in 2017 by President Trump to try to bring economic development via the private sector to communities that basically are poor. I mean, I'm using the term in a way that is not derogatory, but to describe not every community gets to have a qualified opportunity zone. There were areas designated based on income and census tracts. And then it was up to the community to accept it. So for example, in Pennsylvania, there were a certain number, and, and, and we accepted the, the uh, entity, I think the city accepted, the two of them. The only qualified opportunity zones in the county Three, thanks. The only qualified opportunity zones in the county are in the city. So what does it mean? It means that outside investors are willing to put their money into investing in projects in our community with the provision that there's some skin in the game by the people in the community. In this case, this fund that came to us, or we actually reached out and back and forth, asked that 
the county put in 1.25 million, the city put in 1.25 million, the chamber and the foundation, and they would bring 20 million. So we would bring a total of $25 million investment to our community. Um, I am supportive of it because we, it's what I said earlier about the golf course, we are in a community that is spiraling downward with population decline. Our birth rate is, low, is, is lower than it was. I mean, I, I use the example, my wife is one of 10 kids and we have one child. And if I went around this room, it would be a similar story. Um, our death rate is higher because we have lots of older folks. So we're not creating enough new people to replace the workforce. And when you don't replace the workforce, you have trouble, businesses have trouble bringing people into the community uh, investment because there's, there's not, enough, not enough work. Um, okay, so that brings us to the, to the logistics of how it happened. We would enter into an agreement with them. We have told them that there are certain things that we do not want to invest in. One of them is low-income housing. Okay, we've had various investments in low-income housing by various entities. We also said we didn't want to invest in projects that we had already invested in. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the project that's on 3rd uh, Street, the old city. old city. Because we had already made investments. It, and it's not that they're not good projects, but if the commissioners or the city council or the chamber have already made investments, we don't want to just double up on it. But the reason it's important to understand that from the perspective of the fund, the fund is going to do a hands-off analysis of how they can create something in the community that will return an investment. You know, you're talking about $25 million. We are what's called first loss capital. What does that mean? It means that we're the last ones to get our money back. You're looking at a 10-year investment, okay? They're shooting, I think, for a 7% return, 9% Nine. Nine, 9 return to their investors, um, and there's other details. But in the scheme of where we are as a community and what this involves, I say to myself, huh, if there's an opportunity to bring $25 million to the community, I think it's in our best interest as a community to do it. Now, we've got some emails about various projects that are going to be built, an abortion clinic and other things. There's absolutely no indication that they're going to do that, number one. And number two, this project has to be profitable, right? This is not a nonprofit. It's not a charity. They are, they are investing in the community. So I think it's in our interest to, I know it's in our interest in rural Pennsylvania to bring capital investment to our community. The question is, how do we do it? We try to do it and the city with grants and so forth. Every time we go for a grant or anything, we're trying to bring capital to the community. So just to give you a difference, and I'll be quiet let my colleagues speak. To give you a difference, do you remember when Amazon was, was going to build, it built that huge center and they had all those major suburban urban areas competing we never get anything like that. We don't get lots of people coming saying, hey, we want to drop $25 million in your community. I mean, we scrape and we struggle, and that's the way I view my life as an elected official. We are scraping and struggle to bring ourselves up from where we are to try to build this community back. And so I credit the First Community Foundation for stepping up and bringing it to us. We've been discussing it now for about nine months. At a certain point, we have to make a decision or move on because the people who run the fund are needing to invest the money that they aggregate. But I do think that it's in our interest. And I guess part of this is part of a bigger conversation. And, and I'll be gone, so you won't have to listen to me in two weeks. But seriously, it's about a bigger conversation about us as a community finding ways to make this community attractive for people to come here. That's the number one thing. Our children are leaving. I go and I read the obituary. So-and-so's child lives in North Carolina, lives in Washington, D.C. You know, when you, when you read where the kids are. And it saddens me because it makes me realize that 
for a large part of the second half of their life, these kids couldn't be around on a day-to-day -day basis. That doesn't mean that they all leave. There are lots of kids who say, I get that. But all I'm suggesting is we want to create as many conditions that we can to attract investment here, to keep our families here and to keep it. So I, I hope that we can move ahead with this. I, I hope that the public will be supportive and understand that um, it's being done in an effort to try to build back this community. Yeah. Um, how many people are here from the Patriots? Good. Um, I remember the Patriots myself, although I haven't made too many meetings lately. And and I love the way we we, we uh, you know are starting to take a play out of, out of the, the left's playbook, right? We try to create the crisis to get community awareness, and then an action plan. And the action plan is here. This is what you're supposed to be. Okay, we need people to get involved and to give your, your opinions, okay? And, but sometimes you're misguided. And that's why we get the opportunity to tell you why we feel the way we feel, okay? Um, first of all, I think it was, you can answer this question, your first meeting uh, about the Arteris project may have come in 2022, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere around the December. Year ago. Okay. And then we 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 were informed, and then around May 8th, we all, uh, the four entities agreed that we would proceed further without any money. Right? And then um, our terrace would put together an agreement, which was supposed to be here uh, by around Thanksgiving. Okay? So this isn't something that just shot up. It's not something that all the commissioners are going to try to sneak it in. That's not how it works. You know, we have to do our due diligence as well. But that agreement didn't come yet, and, and it, it was for uh, reasons that were beyond them. I mean, they, they, they had some issues trying to draft it um, because of time and schedules. They had other commitments. So that's why, that's why we're tabling. We don't have an agreement in front of us right now. Okay. Um, and then, you know, then what happens is they bring that agreement to us and the four entities are going to get together and, and put parameters within that. Say, what do we want to see in our community? What do we want to see? What's going to benefit? And remember, President Trump, you know, started the, the Opportunity Zones for a reason. Right? Third class cities are struggling across this nation. And there's not enough Dan Klingermans, Blaze Alexanders, and you name them, to invest to make an impact for our society, for our community. Okay? President Trump realized that when you have over a certain percentage of poverty within your area, it's going to make it very difficult for mayors and city councils to, to prosper. There's, they need incentives beyond uh, rack fees, beyond local investments. And by the way, I believe this is the first one that our terrace is actually uh, you seeing if the, a public entity would, would help contribute. Most of them are private. Remember Commissioner Marabito said this is about making money for people that have a lot of money to shelter, tax. They, 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 they're uh, getting some tax relief. They're not, not in the ways of, of uh, LERDAs or property taxes. You know, theirs is, okay, I'll invest the money, we get this return, and I'll be happy. Now, let's, let's put down what we can do. So what we're going to do is we're going to meet and say, here are our um, here are our restrictions or the parameters. We'll all get together, set them up. That's going to be our due diligence. Then our terrorist takes that information, and, and at that time, if we all agree, we're going to pay into that fund, the five million dollars, all four entities. That time our terrorist comes in, 
and they start their due diligence. And that may be 12 months. And they're going to look for their investors, including us, okay, and, and theirs of $20 million. And they're going to they're gonna look to see if there are opportunities that can bring the return that they need for their investors and for us. Okay? If they don't, deal's closed. If they don't meet, if they don't meet the parameters that we set as four organizations, the deal's closed. We get our money back. But let me assure you, what I love about this is that the infusion of $25 million going into our city of Williamsport, which is the county seat, is critical. It's valuable. Our terrace board, they're pretty intelligent. They're pretty, probably most of them are what I would consider wealthy. And they're looking at protecting their funds, but they also have a different goal. And that's to stop self-reliance on uh, that be self-reliant. That's to reduce poverty. That's to put in place certain programs, certain buildings, whatever that uh, investment may be, to better the community and to get a return on our investment. That that's critical. Whether they call it social equity, whatever they want to call it. I, I don't know, but I do know this, that it will better our community as long as they stay within those parameters. This is a key opportunity for Williamsport. It's, it's, a, it's a small piece of the puzzle, okay, because we still need Rackby, we still need Senator Yaw, we still need other grants, we still need the, the state, all right, but we have to pull out of this, this spiral. Williamsport has to stabilize and pull out of the spiral. It cannot, we're only going to get poorer if it's, it's only about taxation, right? We can't survive that way. And you know what? I'm willing to fight for it. And we need, and we need, and we need additional programs that are going to help change the way that pattern's going. Um, I, I'll, I, I will say, you know, you can offer, but we have people, um, Andy and Jen here, that would, I'm sure, want to make a comment. We have some uh, people out in the audience with uh, the city council and, and then the public. Okay, we, we want your public comment as well. I'll keep my comments brief. I, I disagree that our county is, is uh, losing population. I actually think we're increasing population. I, I see parts of our county growing. Um, I see the, the buildings being constructed. Uh, we're getting ready to do an LOI to sell the rest of the land across from the landfill. Uh, there are there are businesses relocating to Lycoming County. Um, we had several last year, and we're looking forward to more. Um, there are houses going up in the eastern part of the county. This is the county seat. I, I agree. I grew up in Williamsport. I care about Williamsport. I love Williamsport. But my issue is this is not a loan. There's no collateral on this. We're the last ones to get our money back, and we do not know what the money's gonna be spent on. As a businessman, anyone who's a business person will not give $1.25 million of their own money, let alone somebody else's money, to something that they don't know what's gonna happen. And that's where I'm hung up on. I understand the, the uh, the advisement committee, but that's what they're doing. They're just advising. We don't know if they're going to honor what they say. These individuals are very smart people. They're here to make money. That's the reason why they're doing it. They want to return on their money, and they should have a return on their money. They're investors. They're smart people. But it may not be what the city of Williamsport needs and wants. Until I have that guarantee of what it's going to be, I can't go along with this. I have to know what it's going to be, um, and if it's going to be in the best interest of the city of Williamsport. Um, that's where I'm at on it. Um, we're responsible for taxpayers' money. They usually do this with private entities, so they're using their own money, investing with other private entities. This is government money. This is taxpayers' money. 
that we're responsible for. And, and I have to know more. I have to know exactly what they're going to do before I say yes. So at this time, I'd like to hear from, um, first of all, I'd like to hear from the city of Williamsport. I have a, I have a question for the city of Williamsport. My question is, my understanding from reading the paper, you're $800,000 in the hole. Your the mayor's proposing a one mil tax increase. Where in the world is the city of Williamsport going to come up with $1.25 million? And I'd like to have that question answered. I asked that of an area council member last week, and they said that's a question that needs to be asked and a question that needs to be answered. And then we'll hear from our terrorists and other entities. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I'm glad you are here so you can present your point of view and answer that question. So my name is Eric Bider. I've been a city council member now for just about two years. I appreciate that the other members of the community are here as well to hear about this. Uh, as has been said already by two of the commissioners, this is not something that we have just come upon in the past couple of weeks. This is something that has been researched and due diligence has been done on for over a year's time. Uh, a gentleman from FCFP has gone to various cities throughout uh, the eastern seaboard to view what Arcteris has done. Uh, this is something that was presented to the city of Williamsport over four years ago by federal programs, specifically the Department of Ag Agriculture, that was endorsed by the Chamber of Commerce as well. So there was a meeting at the um, uh, Trade and Transit 2 in the Ross Room. This was all brought up. The city of Erie has seen massive investments, over $80 million to the tune of this. We were fortunate enough to receive $25 million in uh, American Rescue Plan funds. We were able to put that American Rescue Plan funds to great use to benefit our city. However, to fill budget holes, we were only allowed to take $10 million of that $25 million to allocate for unrestricted funding. You are there is a one mil tax increase that's going to be presented in the budget that we will be discussing tonight. And I can assure you that myself and other members on council have got our surgical gloves and scalpels to go ahead and go to that budget so that way we do not have to look at a one mil tax increase. But there are other things that are at stake here. The county has not done a reassessment in over 20 years. We as city council have to continually sit and refund money to businesses because they're reassessing. So there are a number of things at play. I'm not trying to put blame on the commissioners for this because again, it's been 20 years. It's not been all at their hand. The city itself has had faced issues for multiple years. It's not the current administration's fault. It's not the fault of members of council now. This is one piece of the puzzle that we are looking at to try and solve many, many problems. Another piece, uh, how many residents do we have in the city here? Excellent, thank you all very much for living in the city of Williamsport. I love it, I lived there almost my whole life. The other piece of the puzzle that we have to look at is our tax structure in general. So property taxes, we're almost at 18 mils in the city if we were to go through this one mil tax increase, we're at 16.67, something like that. That is exorbitantly high and the county pointed out, which I thought was a little unfair in their budget, a, they had a dollar bill and it listed how much of your tax dollars go to each entity. The city does claim a huge portion of that. The Waynesport School District also claims a huge portion of that with their millage, roughly the same. But I can assure you what we're going to look at in the future is going to help change that. We need to be proactive about this. In the past 20 years as well, if you look at U.S. Census data, the demographic of 20, 25 to 40 years old has dropped by double digits. Folks of our generation are moving away, just as Commissioner Marabito had said. We are imploring the commissioners, the county, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, chamber and FCFP to continue to do their due diligence with this, as are we, to make Williamsport successful. Because without a successful city, you will not see a successful Muncie, Hughesville, um, Jersey Shore, South Williamsport. So what we're going to do for that funding is we still have our portion of unrestricted funds that we're going to put forward to that. Um, 
because of, as I mentioned, irresponsible government from the city of Williamsport over the past 20 years. They should have increased taxes here and there. They should have cut funding here and there. So we may see a tax increase with that, uh, with the current budget, but it won't be one mil. Thank you. Uh, Adam Yoder, uh, City Council President, um, starting my second term now. Um, it's a privilege to, to serve the city. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here, being interested in um, what's happening in the city county government. Um, Scott, or, uh, Scott, Tony, Rick, um, specifically Tony and Rick, I, I appreciate your comments on this funding, okay? Um, between the two of you, Eric, when you speak about the due diligence, it's been going on. Um, and I heard Tony say something about an abortion clinic, for example. I want to completely dispel any kind of false narrative that's out there. The meetings that I've been in have not ever been brought up, okay? What we really primarily talked about is market rate housing, okay? You've heard a lot today about the population issue, and I just respectfully disagree with Commissioner Metzger. He, he's wrong, okay? You look at the data, our population is continuing to bleed, okay? It's going to continue to bleed over the next 30, 40 years. It's backed up by data from the Center of Rural PA that what they just put out here just the past month. You saw it, okay? The, um, there's a number of different things um, that are impacting that. There's some state government things that are outdated that need to change, okay? Um, there's things that I believe the county can do that would help that as well. Reassessment is one of them. Um, I'd refer you to a Center for Oral PA study that shows that the more consistent or often you do a reassessment, the better off your economic vitality is. It's backed up by statistics, by data, and I can find it and send it to you if you'd like to see that. Um, but let's talk about why else the city is in the position it's in. Let's look at what's going on in the city, what's located in the city. All of the programs that our community relies on are housed here in the city. The amount of nonprofits doing good things are housed in the city that take off the tax rolls. To Councilman Blighter's point about tax reform, our tax structure is based on the 1950s and 60s. It does not align with what's happening out there in the economy. And, that, and the county feels that too. I know you do. You all told me about it, and we've had really good discussions about that. It needs to change. Let's talk about the proposed tax increase, okay? Here's what a reducing the millage in our budget means and where we're at as a city. It means potentially looking at reducing our staffing on our police department, okay? You all see the things in the paper about the crime that happens in the city, right? What city resident in here wants us to really consider reducing our police staffing? Nobody. It means looking at our fire department, our paid professional fire department that the city of Williamsport relies on, but every surrounding municipality also relies on. Anybody want us to look at cutting that? No. I don't want my house burning down, right? I want professionals coming to respond whenever my two-year-old at home is in a precarious situation, okay? Um, that's what we're up against, right? So there's a lot of macro factors that are, frankly, kicking us in the butt, okay? Um, they really hinder our ability to solve these kind of problems. So when we get an opportunity like this, we're excited about it. And to answer your question, this benefits the city. Absolutely it does. You heard it from me, you've heard it from multiple other council members. I think you've heard it from the mayor. So this benefits the city. Um, and, and I'll leave with this. Um, I'll, I'll commend Jen and First Community. Um, you know, this is, this, is a, this is truly a private public partnership, okay? Same kind of model we're working on with Old City, with, with Pine Ridge, who's here. Um, a model that we have used for decades, not only in this county, but across the region. What makes this different um, and what frankly excites me about it is the fact that we don't know exactly what they're going to do. We can tell them what we need um, and communicate the needs of this community, which is our job, and we know 
deeply what the needs of this community are. Okay, They're going to come up with how best to do it. That's the market working here, right? Um, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, much different, or a little bit different than what we've done in the past, right? Um, and, and I believe a lot of what we've done in the past um, has, has yielded some pretty positive results, but um, we need to do more. Our population continues to bleed, and, and that, that, that phrase, the definition of insanity, is doing the same thing and, and expecting different results, you know, um, this is a good opportunity for innovation in our local economic development. Um, I hope whenever you do vote on this, um, and I know there's an incoming commissioner back here, um, I hope you'll support it. Um, I look forward to a continued partnership, Scott, with you, uh, Mark. Um, looking forward to working with you. Um, Rick and Tony, my congratulations, my thanks for your service to the county. Um, and, and, and this is going to sound a little out there, but uh, I appreciate both of you for your differences in views. I've listened to you two go back and forth. Um, and it's a good thing because I think the best results from this board have come because of that, right? It's a good thing. Um, and, and you've been able to do it and actually listen, right? And, and let a lot of the political narrative outside of um, things not cloud your ability to think through. Um, it's a model that needs to continue that I know that we try to emulate at the city um, and that our incoming commissioners can learn from. Um, it's good government. You both practice good government, Scott. You have, and you're going to continue to. I applaud you both for that. That, that does not get spoken a lot, and it needs to. So thank you. I do have a question for you. You mentioned uh, possibly market rate housing. Williamsport is in a land block. Okay, unless houses are torn down. So the only houses that I can see the land that would be available would be around the Williamsport office. That's the only land I see that would be available. So, um, and that isn't an opportunity zone. That is a federal opportunity zone. Um, I can't think of anywhere else where they would talk about market rate housing. Can you think of anything? Uh, the big thing that comes to mind, you know, what, what I'm part of what I'm hoping to understand here or, or see, you know, as a part of this, like you talk about Commissioner Metzger, they're going to look at how are they going to do it. Right, um, you know, there could be some zoning things that we don't know about that we need to do that are going to come, hopefully come from this, which is great. The other component of this that I would say is, um, if you go through the city, you look at the housing stock. Um, we have a lot of blight in the city now. We're working to tackle that right through our land bank redevelopment authority, um, but there could be another opportunity there for them to do the same kind of thing. Okay, um, that's what I look for, and I'm hoping to see. Okay. Can I answer your question, Scott? Okay. Thank I'm, you. I'm just going to add a, a couple of things to your comments. Mm -hmm. Is that by leveraging $1.25 million, mm -hmm. okay, to get a return right away of uh, $20 million, $250 million, because in, in uh, Erie, where they've done this, and I went up there and traveled and talked to some of the business owners and talked to some of the community there downtown. If you haven't been to Erie lately, go. It's incredible. It's they they really changed the whole look of Erie. We love going there now, and uh, they increased their. <coughs> I'll be able to speak about that a little bit later, but they got more than what they were asking for because the investors saw the opportunity to do it and really change what it looks like. Um, our terrorists can do the same thing here, and and when we're talking about that kind of money. We're talking about a little bit more relief, okay, mm -hmm. which is really important. If we were to lose a third, our third class city status, we lose state and federal money. And you know where it's going to come down to? Safety. You make a good comment, okay? When you can't afford to pay for your police and it's no longer mandated, guess what you're going to do? you're not going to pay for it. We are at a critical spot where every every little thing that we do will help the big picture. I mean, we need to be looking at the big picture here. 
and I, and I'm saying this, be, you know, for Williamsport, but how Williamsport goes, so does the county. Yep. And um, yeah, okay. Let's get some more comments. Okay. Thank you, both. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. For Jenner. Hi, my name is Andy Harris, and I'm uh, here today in my capacity as a member of the Investment Committee for the First Community Foundation Partnership. Also born and raised in Williamsport, I'm a landlord and a business owner locally. Um, I was first introduced to Arc Terrace, uh, I think it was September of last year, at which point the then CFO invited me to, uh, to uh, visit a, uh, a due diligence meeting in Baltimore where I had a chance to firsthand uh, witness what they were working on. And in Baltimore, they took an area of the uh, of the city where the, 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 the show The Wire was filmed, very desolate area, and um, procured dozens of acres and, and redeveloped the area. In addition to that, I saw some large-scale businesses where they were able to create good working jobs in areas where they, they had lots of challenges. They also worked on food banks, bringing food to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bringing food to, uh, to areas that were food deserts. What was interesting is in that community, there was certain needs that were specified that they partnered with Arcteris in order to, to solve. I found out about Erie, I have some friends that live in Erie, and, uh, and I was introduced to several different people working in the community, both business owners, um, but predominantly real estate developers. And I wanted to find outside of our due diligence, what was it like on the ground? Because there was some opposition in these communities. And what I found was that the opposition was from people that weren't really informed on, on what was happening. What our terrorists did was they were one tool in a toolkit that was able to help redevelop the city based upon what was, what was asked of them. So in that particular instance, the majority of the funding came from uh, the chairman of, uh, of Erie, uh, Erie Insurance, and they they built a large food bank. They did large market rate housing. There was a need for market rate housing, much like in Williamsport, where we have a lot of low income housing. So again, Arc Terrace partnered with the local community in order to see what the needs were. They then worked together to collaborate and figure out how could they best improve the community. What's interesting about it, these impact opportunity zone funds is that the money needs to stay invested for 10 years. So we're not talking about charlatans that are coming to town to do whatever they want because they want to make a quick buck. They're looking to deploy money on a tax advantage basis for people that are looking to shelter their gains. And by taking advantage of this Trump administration uh, opportunity zone, which was formed in 2017, people are able to defer that taxation but it has to have real community impact. So at this point, when we've asked the question to Arcteris, where are you going to deploy the money in Williamsport? They say, we don't know. We need to know what the community needs are. We want to have a local advisory board, which would be populated by members of the four groups that would be funding this. And it would be a collaboration in order to yield good results. I simply bring this up because Commissioner Metzger, you've pointed out several times that you will not deploy money unless you know where it's going. In my role as an investment advisor, we work within mandates of where money should be in invested. And we'll provide parameters by which an investment manager can deploy money. They will then seek opportunities within the lanes that they are given. And I believe at our meeting a month ago in which I met with, with all of you, which I appreciate that time, I believe we went through that ad nauseum, that we were going to be looking to partner based upon an advisory committee and that we would be looking for restrictive endorsements within the agreement to where the money could be put. So this is a collaborative effort. It's something that will be a long-term partnership. And our Arcteris and the Opportunity Zone funds should be one arrow in the quiver, but not the entirety of the solution. I'm a 46-year-old business owner. I've got two kids in this community. My parents live here. My in-laws live here. My brother just moved back. I love this community, and I'm doing my best as a business owner, as a landlord, and as a, 
as a family man, specifically in this role, to make this a better place for my children to want to be here in the future. And I think that this is a once in a generation opportunity to bring outside money. I want to do the math as a businessman. Commissioner Metzger, you had said as a businessman, you would never deploy money without knowing where it was going. So I do want to tell you where it will be going from an economic impact. $1.25 million begets five locally. $5 million begets 20. So we've got $25 million worth of equity which can be deployed in our community. That's just the equity. As a businessman, we use equity and leverage. It is expected that there will be somewhere between 60 and $80 million that would actually be committed to our community as this is leveraged out. The other thing is, uh, our terrace works with other organizations. When they come to a community and bring money, there are other people saying, wow, we've got a vibrant, forward-looking community. How can we hop on? And I expect that there will be other opportunities coming to our community. So I can't tell you where the money would be deployed exactly, other than it would be restricted to the endorsements that we collectively bring to the table and that that $1.25 million would likely yield 60 to $80 million worth of investment. And as a business person, I'd be very surprised to turn down those opportunities. That's not guaranteed. It's what's happened in the other case studies that we've looked at, and we've done all the due diligence that we can. Are there any questions? No, I, I just want to follow up with a couple of points. I, I think that, the, the, that that's a really important point, that the, that the stimulus of the $25 million is going to bring in additional investment. It, it happens. We, we know it happens. That's one of the reasons we support the Old City Project and the other projects, because the, whether it's the housing starts that we're doing in, in Loyal Sock and so forth, we're doing it because we hope that we create the conditions for additional investment. Um, we often don't know what's really being done with the money we allocate. Now, when I say that to the citizens, I want you to understand what that means. We invested in the mall by loaning money to the people who are, who are buying and redeveloping the mall. We have protections on that money, there's no question. It's a loan. It's, it's a loan, and we have protections and, and liens and so forth. But we also allocate money to different programs, whether it's the Housing Starts program, where people are going to build infrastructure, or whether it's, I'm pointing here because Jerry is here, whether it's the Old City Project, and we do due diligence to be sure that the entities are able to do the project, but there's never any, uh, you know, assuredness in life about everything. You know, I'm I'm redoing a building on Third Street and with my own money. And the question is, am I going to be able to rent it to people in this city? Will I be able to get people to actually come into the city and live? And so the bank says that they look at it and they say, well, Rick, you know what? Based on your track record and so forth, we think that you're going to be able to make it happen. We have to take risks if we want to move ahead. We don't do it irresponsibly, and investing $1.25 million in this fund, I don't believe is irresponsible. And then the other thing I just want to say is that there's some business people that, and this has not been mentioned, and we really might as well just get it out on the table. There's some business people who are opposing this behind the scenes. They are people who have long-term established businesses in the community. They're very wealthy. And I think they're afraid that there's going to be competition for employees if we get additional investment. And there's going to be competition that's going to create wages going up. I call that the politics of scarcity, which is that if we all continue to just live in the little bubble and are not afraid to like move out and to say to the folks who are successful, listen, you know, you can't take all the water from the well. You, you have to make room because that has not been spoken. It's the unspoken opposition that's happening in this community by certain successful business people. I like them, they're nice people, but at the end of the day, they have to understand that if we continue to live in an insular parochial atmosphere, we are not gonna move ahead. And we owe it to the young people to make room for them to be able to have a place where they can raise their families. And so I hope that those folks will understand that at the end of the day, I think they're actually gonna be better off. Because if this, 
community grows, they're going to be able to even grow their businesses even more. And uh, you know, I just I, I say that with all respect to them and not in a derogatory way, but I think that it's been the unspoken gorilla in the room, and we need to really be clear about it. We only grow if we all grow together, and part of that means that we're willing to to take some risk. Listen, the money that the city's putting in is, is money they got from the federal government, which is, means they're leveraging an investment instead of just using it. It's not going to be ARPA. General fund. It's going to be used general fund. Okay, well, that's your decision. You folks are elected officials. You make it. We, okay. we can use Act 13 funds. Are you anything else? No, I wanted to thank you for all the efforts everybody's put in over the last year. Thank, um, you. thank you so much. Yeah, for the we really appreciate it. Jen? Yeah. And, and to Commissioner Marabito's point, it, I want to clarify something. We're doing our due diligence. Absolutely. The majority of those people that he's talking about are in favor of this. As long as it's as long as we we set those parameters of, of what uh, we're going to allow. So I'm Jennifer Wilson. I'm the president of First Community Foundation Partnership of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm also a resident of Williamsport. Thank you for all the time that we've spent together over almost. I mean, it's been a year probably for us since we were first introduced to the program. I really only wanted to come today because I know at the last meeting there was some discussion about um, ARC terrorists and maybe not really knowing who they were. And I, I, I feel like you've all addressed that um, adequately. I don't think I can add any more to that. Um, probably no one has met with them on the commissioner's board more than uh, Commissioner Metzger um, and maybe Commissioner Mayor Vito. I think Commissioner Vissera, you're a little later um, in our process, but you've met them from the very beginning, including the managing partner, Jonathan Tower, um, and Patrick Mullen, who is their director of, I think, belief strategic programs, and, and that's who we've been working with. They've been to our community um, at least two times in person. We've done a number of virtual meetings with them. Um, in addition, we spent time uh, with our partners, representatives from the Chamber of Commerce, from the City of Williamsport, uh, Commissioner Mirabito and Commissioner Metzger, as well as representatives from FCFP, um, actually doing a group uh, tour of the federal opportunity zones that are designated in Williamsport. Um, Gary Narr from the Codes Department of the City took us around so that we could better understand, kind of to Commissioner Metzger's comments about where are the opportunities, what are some of the zoning restrictions we might have to look at, or I should say our Paris would have to look at. Um, so I just wanted the community to know that this is not something that we have entered into lightly or that we haven't done our homework on. The board at FCFP has 24 uh, volunteers uh, from across our area who are committed to the betterment of not just Williamsport, not just like Cumming County, but to our region. Um, the chamber board is 20 plus as well. They've been engaged in the conversation, city council, and of course, um, the commissioner. So there have been a lot of people who have been engaged in this, and while um, the only thing I would really make clear, um, yes, they will select the projects based on if they're profitable. If they don't find projects, then th the money will be returned. Um, so it, it's not that you're right, um, you know, there's not the guarantee, but if, it, if you don't see the projects that we want, um, or they can't find the projects and the parameters that we set and we put in our loan agreements, then the loan is defaulted. Um, so I wanted to provide some assurance about that as well. Additionally, um, the parameters are exactly that. It'll be very specific about the kinds of programs that they can invest in here um, in the Federal Opportunity Zones. Um, so that's a non-negotiable. And the other thing I would say is you said we're the last to get our money back. Actually, FCFP will be the last to get their money back. Because FCFP has decided, we recognize we're a different entity. You know, we've been here for over a hundred years trying to create powerful communities through passionate giving. We leverage philanthropic dollars to do grant making in all sorts of ways to all different kinds of nonprofits and to lots of different municipalities. We've been doing that for over a century. This was an opportunity to create exactly as um, city council members have said, a public-private partnership we think very unique. Um, and we felt it was our job just to bring it to the table so that we could have some great discussions. Um, I think we've had wonderful deliberations. I think we'll continue to have those wonderful deliberations. But at the end of the day, FCFP said, our 1.25 million, we'd like it to be subordinate to the city, to the county, and to the chamber. 
so that we can try and ensure that the other partners can get their dollars back out of us. So that, that was the only other clarification I wanted to make. We will be last. You, you made a good point that, that I want to clarify. The chamber, the business community is absolutely behind this, as Commissioner Masser said. The chamber voted 20 to 4, or was it 24 to 4? I wasn't at that meeting. It was in, that in a secret ballot vote. The, the chamber entities voted, I think, 20 to 4 to advance it to the executive committee. Uh, and so the, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the business community is absolutely supportive of this. And, and one other thing I would just clarify, just like FCFP said we would be the last, um, each of the loan documents that we ultimately all look at, um, if there's something in your loan document that isn't in the FCFP loan document, you, know, you can make a specific provision in your document. If something is really important to you, um, Commissioner Mirabito, you've talked about, you feel strongly about not committing dollars to the projects where you've already committed dollars. That's something you should put into your specific loan document. Just like FCFP in our specific loan document is saying, we'll be subordinate, we'll be last. We don't expect anybody else to do that. So there is the opportunity for each of us to have the things that are most important to us be clarified. And, and I think we said that, not because we don't necessarily we want sure. to support them, but we want to have a conversation about it. I was just, it. I would so, just yeah, no, absolutely. no, no, it's a good point. I, and I think that obviously, once you have a conversation, you find out. We just didn't want to be blindsided. And I so, want to thank the community. If I could, before I finish, just thank the community um, for your willingness to listen respectfully um, today to this. And um, certainly would be open to any conversation um, or follow up on behalf of your uh, local community foundation if you have any questions. Thank you, Jen. Do you have any comments from anyone in the public? Yes. OK. Um, Mr. Peters, and I will just go around the room. Jumped up that quick because my meter's running out for the third time. So. <laughs> um, yeah, Don Peters, Cummings Township. I'm here on behalf of, of the residents of Lycoming County. Uh, first of all, before I move forward, again, Commissioner Masser, uh, Commissioner Mayor Vito, actually, we're really going to lose something to losing to both of you. And uh, even though, uh, even in some cases, we haven't always uh, agreed on some things, which is life, uh, I say to both of you. I'm actually impressed by the integrity and in some of the decisions I've seen that it shows that you're above, uh, in many cases, political ideology. I just want to say thank you. I'm not saying all the time, because sometimes we disagree on ideologies. But I'm just impressed about that. I want to I wish you well in your next uh, careers, which I know you'll be doing something. Um, I'll just go through some uh, bullet points I've written down for myself. As I said, I'm a Cummings Township uh, resident. Uh, which means that we have the benefit of helping to pay for this uh, project, but uh, we don't really see a, a great benefit from it. And as I move forward, I want to let you know, there's, I'm going to give you some of the, some of the what I think is the negatives, and I'm also going to give you some positives, because I've done my homework on this as well, as you'd expect. So this isn't, for those of you from the city and from the uh, foundation, I'm not here to poo-poo the idea completely, but I'm going to bring some things, and I'm going to talk about some uh, unspoken gorillas that are in the room as well on this project. I think that was a great phrase. So. I'll go in order as I have them listed here. Um, at the end of the day, I, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Metzger's uh, statement. This, uh, th in my mind, it brings as many questions as it does the answers. At the end of the day, is it a pig and a poke, and what are we getting? And I would want to know that as much as Commissioner Metzger has made that clear. And Commissioner Maramito, you gave some great responses on that, and you said one of the concerns that I actually received myself is, are they going to put an abortion clinic in there? And the question is, you know, you've taken some things off the table. I would recommend that you would take a lot, you would, you would basically ease a lot of people's minds if you say this is one of the things that will not go in this city. That would really help a lot of people and solve a lot of controversy. I would argue that the abortion industry is very profitable in America today. And so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, Next is this about uh, Arct Arcteris. I don't know much about them. Again, I've done my research as much as I can, and obviously they are a business. Uh, I will say this, that they very much embrace the DEI ESG uh, you know, concept, the BIPOC concept. Fine, you know, I, I get that. Frankly, nobody uh, that I know wants the uh, minority community to, to better themselves more than me, and, and you as well. But at the end of the day, we will have to answer to our businesses in this county if we're going to invest that kind of money that uh, basically gives money to 60% of entities and businesses that are, are owned by that community, I just believe we need to be able to justify that 
and say, yes, your skin color disqualifies you. Uh, I will say this, that the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court decision this June, uh, one of the students for fair admissions versus Harvard University, the Supreme Court said race can no longer be considered as a factor in university admissions. I'm not here to talk about our, te our terrorists' policies with respect to what they do as business. That's their business. I'm letting you know that that's what we're signing on to is that ideology and that philosophy. So I want to, again, is it a deal breaker? For me, it's not a deal breaker, but I think it's a conversation that needs to be had with that organization. Uh, next, uh, I'm not sure I don't miss anything. Fourth, I want to thank you, commissioners, for tabling us today. Frankly, especially for you two that are now uh, moving on, as I said, to another career, your decision, frankly, was brilliant. Nobody likes political entities that make vast, sweeping, big money decisions as they leave office, and you've decided not to do that today. I want to thank you for that, because you could have. You clearly could have. You two clearly support us, and you could have made that decision. I want to say thank you. And at the end of the day, when we get the answers we're looking for and this moves forward, frankly, your decision today will look brilliant. Again, when this, I believe, will succeed, if it goes forward and we get the answers that we want, you will look brilliant even after you've left office, and that's the legacy that you both want to leave behind. Uh, I'm going to close on one thing, but just give me a moment to check my notes because I have some things I don't want to miss. I'll close with this. So, in my former career, I had a co-worker. We spent uh, many years together. He's now uh, the uh, chief county detective in Erie, Pennsylvania. And so I communicated with him about this organization as well. And if anybody you would expect but might be skeptical of things that could be like this, it would be somebody in that line of work. And frankly, he said uh, they started building, I think, in 2021 up in Erie. He said right now, he says it's actually a very positive project. It's a very good project. And he was very encouraged by what he saw taking place by this company. So on behalf of the company, kudos to them. They did something good in Erie. And I'll just close with this. Once we know what they're going to do in Lycoming County, even though I'm not going to benefit from it as a resident of, the, of, the, of, you know, of Cummings Township, I say go for it once we get the answers that you're seeing, sir. Okay, okay. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Sir? Yes, you Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Richard Henry. I reside in Wolf Township, Lycoming County. And am I to understand that you have tabled this, that the, the, the new uh, measures will take care of it? There is a motion and a second, so we'll vote on it. Okay. On whether we table it. Okay. Well, that was a lot. It's a lot of on my sales. But that was what I was asking. Speak, speak up, though. Okay. That's what I was asking. It's This is important. Yes. yes. This is really important. One way or another, it's you know, good or bad. That's right. We vote. We tabled it today. We right. we may you know bring, bring it up, up before. I mean, with well, all respect to Don, we don't know if we get documents or whatever. There's a lot of unknowns at this point, and you gentlemen are going to be retiring very shortly. Congratulations. Wish you well. I think it's only right and uh, fair to allow the incoming commissioners to address it because they're the ones going to have to deal with this, you uh, as well as the others. So. You have a great legacy, and you guys have done well, 33 years, 36 years. If you put your stamp on it and it goes south, it's not, you know, it's going to tarnish your legacy. I'd say. You guys have done a great job so far. I moved to this county uh, April 1993. Didn't know anybody in the county. Very quickly found out what the hot topic was at that time. Jesse Bloom, taking money, influx, destroying the 24 city. Everybody's talking about it. I don't mean to speak ill of the dead. I, you know, I know she passed her earlier this year, but I did hear a lot of comments over the years, and every time her name is brought up, it's influx. Negative. Oh, everything negative. She was a mayor. She might have done some wonderful things. I don't know. I never heard about it. They're overshadowed by that thing. So I just ask you just let it go table like the income commissioner's hand. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sir. Yes. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Bruce Clark. I'm a resident of Muncie. I'm going to read you from our Terrace's website.
and this is where I have some real problems. One of their values, and it says our values, stewardship, uphold the highest standards of excellence in social and environmental responsibilities to investor partners and communities. Once again, there's ESG, environmental social governance. What are they doing? Private company coming in, asking the government to help fund their projects. I also have a problem with market rate housing term. As a former U.S. Army recruiter for three years out of Allegheny County, suburb of Pittsburgh, they had Section 8 housing. I was in and out of Section 8 housing throughout those three years. When you bring in Section 8 housing, crime goes up. It's period. It's a fact. Look at, look at any database, FBI, whoever you want to look at. I would be very leery to bring up a deal with this company, especially for their term of market rate housing. This is the first time I've ever heard of that term. Now, I don't know if that's a fancy word, fancy term for Section 8, but you do not want that in your communities. I've seen the devastation that it brings in. I'd also like to read to you that, where is it? Investing in operating businesses, infrastructure, and real estate. They use vague terms to get what they want. Anyone who uses, and I call it, this is my term, I learned it, and I'm a product of it, the you know, 70s and 80s school, weasel words. <laughs> Makes you think one thing when they're saying another. I would be very, very careful with investing and doing business with this group. Thank you for your time. Commissioner Morabito, Commissioner Lucera, I've talked to you both. I wish you both the very best in your retirements. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Commissioners, can I just the point of clarification? Yes. So I just looked up what market rate housing means uh, according to HUD. Market rate housing consists of non-subsidized properties that are rented or owned by those who pay market rate rents or who pay market rate value to purchase the property. This is in contrast to both affordable housing and subsidized affordable housing as both these types of housing types confer special benefits, benefits upon HUD 221-D4 loan borrowers. Okay. Thank you. I so, Mr. Clark, it's the opposite of what you're thinking. It's actually getting people who will pay their rent totally themselves, which is good. It's a higher, you know, hopefully the income levels are higher. So. But the question has to be an answer. The new sport is in a landlock. There's not much land to develop, with the exception of around UPMC and, and maybe a few other areas, unless the blighted properties are torn down. That's yeah. a question that has to be answered. Yes. It's a good thing. Yeah. Good morning, commissioners. I'm also going to talk fast because I also have a problem with the parking meter. Um, and I didn't expect to say anything today because I thought that I would just be coming and observing and supporting the group. But anyway, um, there's one thing that, that I have not heard yet, and that is anyone talking about what these parameters should be. And in my opinion, I, I've spoken to uh, the commissioners before about this. The American system of political economy that was first created by Alexander Hamilton and was the basis for the greatness of America for a long, long time has been ignored. And what that system basically says in a few words is that you need a strong manufacturing base. You have to be able to produce things. And that has to be in cooperation with the agricultural section. And in addition to that, um, you need energy. Now, I've talked to you before about my idea about small nuclear reactors, and I haven't heard that raised at all. But that would be a wonderful thing for Williamsport to bring in, because that way they could supply energy not only to the <coughs> county, but to many counties, and maybe even the whole state. I mean, it could be, become a real 
important hub of uh, productivity. Um, I want to also say that it's not a good idea for the, the commissioners who are leaving, whom I love, <laughs> to be doing such a very important job right now. Best to leave it to the incoming commissioners, in my opinion. Um, and so are you giving us maybe three week vacation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, take it, take it. You guys are with me. Um, and then um, somebody said something about the market being very important to drive this project. And what is more important than the market? It is the people, it is the will of the people. It is not market forces, it's not anything about money, it's not anything about leveraging. I mean, these are all incidental things. But the objective is to improve the condition of the people. And that's the, the main thing that I would like to offer to you to, to keep in mind. Oh, the last thing is private-public partnerships. I studied these in detail some time ago when I lived in the previous state where I moved from. They are, a caveat has to be offered when you do a private partner public-private partnership. It's all in the details. The devil is in the details. And unless you know what that's going to look like, it's not a good idea to, to get into it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to miss you. For sure. mm -hmm. so we'll stay. Don't worry, I'll find you. I know where you live. <laughs> Hi, Richard. Howdy, howdy. Can she leave? Can sit over there? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Rick Hauser from Boyle <laughs> Soccer here in Fabulous County. Again, thank you for your service, Mr. Tony Messer. And believe it or not, thank you to Mr. Miravito. We go back and forth a few times, but we love you just the same. I hope you have a great retirement, both of you. And many more productive years. Um, and moving along here, of course, I think everything major has been covered already that matters. Uh, but it is true. The devil is in the details with this. And what needs to be done is this, this agreement is going to have to be tight. And whatever public disclosure can be made about what its uh, final iteration is going to be is going to be super important. Because uh, to, to say that we get schnookered uh, by situations like this, and I'm not blaming you guys. I'm saying that it happens. How many things have we voted for? How many things have we gotten in bills from the federal government, et cetera, that's supposed to be one thing? The one that I love the best is the Inflation Reduction Act. That's, that's a jewel. But things like this that are totally antithetical to whatever they're supposed to be, and this we can't afford. And again, the $20 million, it's great. It's a big pot of money. And it's very enticing for any area like ours to look at this and say, yes, we desperately need that sort of investment. But the word desperately can motivate things. We never should be motivated by desperation, no matter how tough things get. What we need to do has to be honorable, and it has to be forthwith and right for the people of the community in the long term. And this is the one thing that I absolutely, even though we're talking about Williamsport, basically, but it all affects the, com the entire community and the county, as you pointed out. We have to make sure that all those things, we don't end up with a schnooker down the line, that we are totally covered and that we should know there shouldn't be any ambiguities about the sorts of projects that we're going to see here. Well, we don't know what they're going to invest in. Now, I'm not going to run into the abortion clinic stuff and different things, and black helicopter theories, etc., but the possibilities are there. I mean, if something like that happens, as it was pointed out by Mr. Don Peters, yes, murdering unborn children is excessively um, profitable, and it's a, it's, a, it's a shame. There are country labors under that type of situation even yet. But that, plus the fact that we're looking at a reassessment, it seems to all sort of tie in together. And really, I mean, the folks in this area, as you've rightly pointed out, it's a poor area. We're losing population. And uh, 
it would be lovely if we had somebody that comes in and says, yes, we'd like to take 20 acres of Reach Road and build something that makes, you know, that we have factories. We have something for people to go to work to. Housing's great, but the whole thing of it is, the people have to have something to do in order to buy the house. And if we don't have that, I think we really keep putting the cart before the horse. And the last thing here that I didn't hear actually mentioned specifically, and I could go on and you know, I could burn up more time, the whole thing of it is, the Obama administration many moons ago, because of wanting to get rid of private landholds, basically, the picket fence and, you know, the house and the yard with the dog and the kids and all this. I mean, this is what the American dream is. And there is, through the public partner, par partner court uh, type of uh, arrangements that are going together, uh, with some of these situations where they're actually advocating for destroying your zoning systems, etc., where we can have a housing area where there are homes, uh, basically private, single-family homes, and eventually what they want to do is take those sections out. And again, you, I think you already said that they're not going to do uh, large-scale, uh, low-income housing, apartment houses, etc. And that's important, but again, I don't want to see something down the line where that drastically changes. Because there is a move afoot at the governmental level, and certainly with some other uh, partnerships that are made with government through private enterprise, you might call it fascism because that's what it is. When you bind private enterprise with government, you tie it together. And that's a fascistic situation. And what can happen is you can lose your zoning and suddenly you got a you know, 15, 20 unit apartment house springs up in an area where there might be a couple of bad homes, but there's enough of a lot to build this and you, you destroy the cohesion of your communities and the ownership. See, we're moving away from an ownership society with this. Um, and I'm hoping, I'm not trying to get off, off of a subject here, but I just want to make sure, you know, and I think everybody in here for their own reasons want to make sure that whatever happens here, that it passes muster with the people that pay the freight here in the city and in the surrounding communities that we know for a fact what kind of investments that are going to be made and what those impacts are going to be on each one of us and that we don't have another situation where we're chasing the ball down the hill and we're never going to catch it and we find that we've gotten stuck. I just don't want to see that and I know that you don't want to and I'm, I'm very pleased at your reticence to sign on with this Mr. Metzger. I'm very pleased because I think once you ink something it's done. And we, we need have, to know. We have to have more questions answered. Yes. Yeah. And I absolutely 1,000% agree with that. Yeah. Again, I thank you again for your time. And I thank uh, Mr. Masser and Mr. Mirvio for your service on this board. Thank you. Take care and have a great thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Morning. Good Good afternoon now. I'm Sharon Cleese. I'm from Montoursville. I was raised and born in Waynesport. I'm glad I'm in Montoursville now, though. Um, I don't want to make this political. Um, I just want to say that Mr. Mr. Trump, President Trump, in 2017, passed this for third-class cities and states and everything for the good. And unfortunately, in 2020, it was all eradicated. We have a fake administration in there now. The election was stolen. And I have to say that we need him back very desperately for what's going in our state, for what's going on in the country, in the world. And I know Mr. Metzger, that you probably cannot give the names of these entities that want to want this 25 million to do in our areas, but we can have something that's going to be destructive with diversity, equity, 
and inclusion. I voted for Obama because I didn't know the whole story. And Obama basically was never vetted. He ran on fundamentally changing the United States of America. But I think this change has been going on since the assassination of JFK. And we're just waking up to everything is radical now. But it's so important that we know that Satan is the god of this world. We see the evil happening in our state and in our country and in the world. And the heart, Jeremiah says this, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it. And sometimes people get caught up in money and they think they're doing good for a community but we have to know that it's for the good of the people and not just of the counselors the administrators it's good for we the people of our state of our country this is the first time I've spoken about anything like this. Uh, we have to protect our children in the school districts. We can't have their minds open to LGBTQ, sexualizing our children, and we have the right people in the school boards, hopefully. But I respect you very much, Mr. Metzger, because you are speaking the truth and we need more people like that and not just going along with what's going on in the country and in our state and I just hope it continues that way. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. We have a motion to the table. We have a second. All in favor say aye to the table. Aye. aye. It is your by table. Okay, 6.5. Uh, all right. Um, Commissioner seeking your approval on the reappointment of the following individual to the Conservation District. And I think we'll combine 6.5 and 6.6 because six, six, they're all conservation. Sounds so. good. Um, so we're, I'm seeking approval for the following reappointments. Um, uh, never mind. See my mistake. One reappointment and two of them. So two separate actions. Okay. Uh, seeking approval for a reappointment to the Conservation District of Thomas Ham, effective 1 January 2024 through 31 December 2027 for a four-year term. Okay, a motion? I'll move to I'll second. I'll be your side. Aye. 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 So carried. Uh, 6.6, .6, Commissioner seeking your approval on the appointment of the following individuals to the Conservation District. Aaron Cole, uh, effective 1 January 2024 through 31 December 27 for a four-year term. And Commissioner Scott Metzger, effective 1 January 2024 through 31 December 2026. Correction, 2024, one year. Motion. I'll move to approve and welcome you to the conservation district. Thank, Thank you. you. I uh, look forward to filling your shoes and trying to do as well as you did with the conservation district. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Uh, second. <laughs> <laughs> there was, yeah, I second. Aye. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I will. <laughs> and then we pick on. <laughs> Commissioner seeking uh, your approval on the award of the continuing adult probation and parole grant funds with PCCP for more formerly the Pennsylvania uh, Commission on Crime and Delinquency in the amount of $161,590. This is the 2023-2024 budget item. I'll move to approve. I'll second. 
Very side. Aye. Aye. So carried. Commissioner seeking your approval on a revision to the budget table work order for the 2022 through 2028 Williamsport Master Planning Grant Agreement. Motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. I'm on your side. Aye. Aye. So carried. Uh, lastly, Commissioner seeking your approval on the project management proposal extension for the Old City Williamsport Mixed Use Development uh, RAC T grant. And this is a six month extension. Okay, motion. I'll move to approve. Um, I'll, I'll second. I do have some questions. Um, so, could it have been a year extension? Or I'm not exactly sure on the extension of the RAC, but I would assume that you can extend it for more than six months, I would, I would think. Or is it is that the standard? Jim? As far as I know, that was what they requested. I, I can't tell you because that was my I put that on the agenda. But I as far as I know, that was what they requested. Well, we not, and I don't think there are limits on it. I think that's what was. I think if request. you wanted to go a year out, you could probably get it. Or yeah. you could do it again. Yeah. 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 You can go for another it's extension. More, if it's more needed. specific than that. It's actually an extension for the filing of the project management proposal. Okay. okay. I think we've done those in not six months months extension months. before. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The right. side. agenda item is to purchase uh, is a contract to purchase five additional years of licensing preventative maintenance and service for the components of our certified voting system here in the county uh, so this uh, covers the ballot design computer and software the election results computer and software our central scanners uh, that are used for mail ballots and the precinct level ballot scanners and ADA devices that go out to our polling places. Uh, so this five years of additional coverage would run from 2024 to 2029, and this is a 2024 uh, budgeted expense. Okay. Is is any of this able to be paid for with uh, the act? Um, I mean, potentially. Uh, the, the challenge there is that we only get so much <coughs> per year, and right. we've already been categorizing expenses toward it. If, from an accounting perspective, it could be difficult because we're talking about multiple years of expenses all at once, and <coughs> would they be split out? But overall, we're, we're not having any problems documenting enough eligible expenditures to make sure we receive our full Act 88 funding. So. This would kind of be neither here nor there. Yeah. With respect to it. I'll move to the three. A second. Well, here's I. Aye. 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 So carry. And and let me say before I step down, uh, thank you, Commissioners Masser and Mirabito, for your years of service to to voter services. You know, as members of the Board of Elections, uh, we've had some interesting times in the field of election administration <coughs> during your during your time on the board. And I and I do thank you for your attention and dedication and and support. It's been fun. You're the best. Thank, thank you for it. Hey, Leslie. Just a minute. Now that's a superstar. Rockstar. A rock star. See, I can't get that. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Today I'm. Uh, seeking your approval to approve our MyTel maintenance agreement for $13,702.48. This is just a support agreement for all of our phone systems throughout Lycoming County. Okay, this is 2024 budget. Uh, 2024 yeah. budget. Yep. A motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. All here, so aye. 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 Security. Uh, commissioners, our second um, agreement I'm seeking your approval for an MFA which is a multi-factor authentication software um, which will include tokens as well it is a 2023 budgeted item 
in the amount of fifty nine thousand six hundred and forty eight dollars this um, this software purchase will allow us to carry a larger cyber liability insurance policy um, we would be able to go from one million to two million I believe Matt. or maybe more importantly it doesn't it maintains the two million and doesn't drop no. us down to a million. Motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. On your side. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, hey, Hutch. Hey, good afternoon. Seeking your <coughs> approval of the appointment of Stacy Folk as the Lycoming County Emergency Management Coordinator. Um, she's already been hired into the position. This is the formal approval, so it can be sent to the governor's office for signature. Okay, motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Move for sign. Aye. 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 So carried. Thank you, Hutch. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Commissioner seeking your approval on the agreement with George Jr. Republic uh, in Pennsylvania. And this is a 2023 through 2024 budget item for JPO. Um, again, you guys should be familiar with George Jr., just another facility that we have a contract with in the event we need to provide services to uh, two minutes. Again, it's a uh, facility that's actually located in Grove City, which is about a four, four and a half hour drive from here. Almost on almost the state of Ohio, so uh, again, the, travel, the traveling that is required from our officers going back and forth to place juveniles is, is a, uh, something that we have to look at in the future and hopefully find something closer. Every time I, I read the George Jr. Republic, I think of Curious George <laughs> <laughs> and the books. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but for some reason it. <clears throat> Books I used to read my kid, it's in my head. I'll move to approve George Jr. Okay, I'm glad you were curious enough to make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> now that was good. Second, I'm going to say aye. Aye. That was quick. That was, that was quick. You your Seinfeld uh, days are kind of off. 6 15 and 16, Malik. Good afternoon. Seeking your approval for the amendment to the wayfinding plan grant agreement with DCNR. This is a no cost, one time extension for the contract to extend to December 2024. Okay, motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All clear, sign. Aye. 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 So carried. Seeking your approval for the agreement with the Ridge at Mill Creek. This is a 23 24 budgeted item. This is for their Housing Starts Initiative project. So for the construction of infrastructure for the Han Hill property near the town farm. And motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Second comments? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. One of you go. No, this is a good example. This is why it's so important for us to recognize that while sometimes we may be doing something that helps one area, you know, this is specifically a housing starts program that's in, in Loyal Sock. But again, if we get people living in Loyal Sock, they're going to shop in Williamsport, they're going to go to the hospitals, their kids may go to the colleges. Uh, they may go out to Muncie to do something. So it's just part of another effort by the commissioners to stimulate the housing market uh, by helping to build the infrastructure uh, that's necessary. This is part of our housing initiatives program where we allocated two million last year, two million this year. Right. We're actually impl implementing it now uh, to bring additional housing to the county. Right. In the sense of infrastructure. Right. Yeah, and I think it's very important to, to know that here's a private investor. Right. That is is going to use public funds, okay, um, and we're going to be seeking a rate of return quickly in, in this particular case. My question is, is that we did have a, a, a couple questions before we were going to release these funds uh, as to if, if all, all your uh, funding and revenue streams were complete <coughs> and, and validated. So, so the banks all has the approvements, every, everything's ready. And, and releasing these funds then will uh, initiate the, the what? The, the 
land movement and whatnot. So do, could you speak, I'm sorry, but no. could you speak uh, to that? I knew I should have called them sick today. <laughs> <laughs> so the funding that you guys are providing, the county's providing us, will go to earthwork as well as infrastructure for storm water, uh, water line deliveries, sewer, sanitary. Uh, so that infrastructure will be key there. As you said, investing these dollars also allows the authorities, you know, to tap these and recoup some of their rate of uh, investment there. So overall, you'll see, as we discussed in the past, that investment quickly returned back to the uh, county. I'm also pleased to tell you guys that last night we inked the 51st agreement. So. Good. We are moving towards a complete sellout of 57 months. Nice. Right. So, and so what, for the public, what this means is we took now, this money is coming from our Act 13 money, right? And actually, I have to, this is a good example of how ideas come from the public. Brent Fish brought to us uh, via the chamber the idea that we needed to try to help stimulate the housing market because there weren't a lot of listings. Jerry came, Jerry's a developer. And uh, Jerry applied, uh, along with other developers, to say, listen, we could really use help with, um, with infrastructure, because obviously if, if the private-public partnership is paying for it, it reduces what you have to charge the people buying the house, right? And it also makes it easier to get people in to buy a lot if they know that, OK, the water sewer is going to be there, as opposed to, oh, by the way, here's the cost for the lot, and you're going to have to pay X amount of money to, to get the water sewer there. So what does it do for the members of the public? It puts 57 houses on the tax rolls, which will reduce the burden on everyone. Yep. You know, the way we get ourselves out of high taxes is by growth, uh, not growth that's unrestrained, not growth that doesn't have some sort of uh, logic to it, but growth uh, to, to the point that uh, Mr. Hauser made. You know, we want growth that's going to be in the interest of the public. So. Yep. Yes, sir. For uh, full disclosure, who is the gentleman speaking? He did he fail to identify himself. I, I know. My apologies. Uh, Jerry Larivia with the Bridge of Mill Creek. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a motion. Second. On your side. Hi. 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 So carry. Congratulations. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, congratulations. All right, commissioner's comment at this time. You guys have anything? We were gonna congratulate you on being made President of CETACOG, which we did. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. It's, it's uh, an honor to serve with the other 11 uh, counties, other 10 counties, 11 total, and uh, it's something that hasn't happened to the Commissioner of Lycoming County for approximately 15 years. Has it been 15? Yeah, so um, very nice of them. To, you know, I look forward to serving and bringing back information that can help our county. Now, this, this is not going to be your last uh, Commissioner's meeting, is it? We have two more. No. Yeah, right, absolutely. I, I think somehow someone missed yeah. it. Right. I just thought I wasn't going to show up. I, I didn't know whether you are taking the rest of the time off. No. no. We have to vote on the budget yeah, say, next, say. to tell the public we'll be voting on the budget so next week. And talk about reassessment. So. And talk about I just reassessment. do want to make, I do want to make a comment here yeah. real quick. And, and that has to do with, um, uh, we have two payments uh, that have not been paid to vendors. One's the Sun Gazette and one is to Fred Hand. Fred Hand. And um, uh, I looked at the contract, and it's being held up by, by the controller, who has every right to hold it up and ask the questions, okay, if, if it's not according to the contract. Um, but within that contract, and, and I'm saying this because I don't want to cause any irreparable harm to my coming county. If we do not pay this invoice to, to Sun Gazette, they will no longer put the columns in. And if there's no columns, there are no public meetings. There are no grant funds. And to me, frankly, it's an abuse of power, is, is what I see this as. And, and I'm not afraid to stand up and say this. When you have a vendor who is picking up trash for the county, doesn't know how many bags of trash you're going to have over the, the entire year. And if there are more uh, situations like Rick and I are emptying our offices out now. We have tons of garbage going out, or, or paperwork going out. She's not paying these bills. She's not paying their bills. And in that contract, there's there's a 2.2 that, that says uh, you can charge more um, uh, 
for services that are provided that are unseen. And, uh, but it has to be approved by the county. We approve it. I'm telling you right now, we approve it. And we have the invoices of the extra payments, of the, of the reasons why they are paid or, or should be paid. So um, I don't understand why they are not being paid now. Um, we've made several comments, and, and I think that this leads to the bigger issue of who's in charge of the finances of this county. And, and we say we are in charge, and it specifically states that in the county code and even in our contracts uh, that are signed by the county commissioners. So uh, I hope the controller does the right thing and gets these people paid by, by the end of this week or we could suffer uh, severe consequences. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, you have anything? Okay, public comment? Yes, please. Uh, ask you to keep it to county issues and keep your comments brief. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. Scott Miller, 822 Tucker Street, Williamsport. Before I get to what I mainly came here for while Forrest is here, myself and a number of us were very dismayed that when we put our ballots in the computer didn't show who we voted for and really would like to know that you know we voted for this person that person and not you know somebody else just as a visual confirmation i don't know if the computer program could do that but myself and a number of people were very dismayed about that uh, uh, i mean that that would be a violation of the state constitution if the voting system was to show the content of someone's vote on the screen. You know, so for every person like you who might appreciate a some kind of verification on the screen, there are lots of other people who would be concerned about that compromising the secrecy of their ballot. And the Constitution says we can't compromise the secrecy of their ballot. Well, so I think there's some way you could have a little curtain or something to make it where only I see it and then you know, hit a button and say, okay, you know, that's it, you know, and it goes blank. You know, I realize I don't want everybody in the room seeing, you know, who I vote for, but uh, uh, I would like to be able to confirm that everybody I did vote for uh, was, and people I did not vote for were not getting that because it actually has been an issue in Pennsylvania. So... The, well, yeah. the paper ballot is its own verification because you can see what ovals you filled in, and that's what the scanner counts. And uh, you know, I'm. I'm gonna I, I understand this. Uh, I only bring it up because I just want to express my opinion on that, and I don't care what the law says. I would like to, you know, have that visual confirmation personally. Uh, the reason I came here, though is about the uh, reassessment. I absolutely agree that we do need to have a reassessment because it's been so long. But for a number of years, I've said, instead of paying one to two million dollars for a reassessment, I bought my house here in Williamsport in 2005. On the tax thing, it says a uh, value of 48.5 approximately. I paid 52.5. Is there really any way I can say that my house is not worth the 52.5 that I told the bank it's worth? And if we did that, you know, not, not just today, but had done it since 2005, even though it may not be absolutely fair to each and every person, it would have moved that goal slowly where the county would get a slight increase each year because of houses being, you know, sold. Uh, I, I don't know the county's numbers, but just generally nationwide, it's every seven to 10 years, houses are resold. And, and so, you know, if you think about it, how many houses in Lycoming County have been bought and resold, you know, since the last assessment and what would it have gone up, you know? And, 
I'm not saying that you can never or should never have uh, a reassessment, but one of the things too is I know a lot of elderly people that I used to do odd jobs for, and I can remember one lady in particular, 96 years old, getting $700 in Social Security, and everything kept going up, but it didn't seem like her Social Security check kept up, and here this woman you know, is trying to survive off of seven hundred dollars a month, and and I just felt that, sh that we're taxing people out of their home, and then going to put them in a nursing home where Medicaid pays five thousand dollars a month, but we can't, you know, find a way to alleviate that tax burden to keep her in her home. I'm sorry, not the Bible I read. Also. The reassessment, the mall, y'all gave them a refund because everybody moved out and you lowered the tax value of the property. Now they get an alert up that says, if you rent out those empty stores that you vacated, you don't have to pay tax for the increase in value. I'm sorry, you know, like, so if I move out of my house and it's vacant for a while, I can declare it worthless and get alerta and move back in and say, oh, now it has value, but I don't have to pay tax? That's what that seems like to me out there at the mall, is for whatever reason, above my pay grade, everybody left. Y'all said it's worth a lot less, and now you've given them alerta that says it goes back to the value that it was prior to the reduction. You don't have to pay tax on it. How is that fair to me? It just doesn't seem fair. Thank you, Tony and Rick, for your service. Y'all know I both have supported you in years past. And one of the things I would like to say about Tony that he gets much respect from me. You see him in a suit. I saw him at his business with a broom and a shovel and emptying trash cans. Any man like that that's willing to get there and sweep and shovel and empty trash cans deserve some respect. Have a great life, y'all do. And glad you're the, now the senior citizen, Scott. I guess so. <laughs> okay, thank you, Scott. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. And if you keep your comments brief, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Once again, good afternoon. Um, just to comment on the voting display situation, Mr. Lehman, I had I made a mistake on my ballot. I tried correcting it, X out, and then initialed by it, and then put it in who I wanted to vote for. The machine caught it. The judge there, very nice judge, said you know it you know kicked it back because of the mistake. The judge said, here's our options. I chose the option of having my that ballot destroyed, which happened, and then yeah, I was given a new ballot, filled it out correctly, and it went through. So yes, the system is working, and it is for our protection. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, on reassessment, I purchased my home for, we'll say, D amount. Insurance-wise, it is now over one-third more to rebuild that same property. So that's something that I believe the county has to look at. The values of rebuilding. And then that would give you an accurate assessment rate of, you know, okay, this is what the tax should be. Because this is the, you know, the value of the house from the real estate people, and this is the value from the banks and in the insurance companies. Because they actually, initially when I purchased my house, they said, okay, you know, this much insurance. After they came, did the, the actual physical assessment, which they did do, and said, okay, we're sorry, Mr. Clark, but we've got to raise, you know, your insurance premium, you know, so you have the coverage, so if something does happen, your house will be rebuilt. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're already. I can check my meter. <laughs> so, Are you sure? Okay. I think he's saying talk slow. 
Um, first, I'd like to thank you for stepping up and representing us when it came to, I think it was 6.4 on the agenda. Because um, you spoke your mind, and that's what, you know, I appreciate that. Because yeah, I personally, if I'm going to invest in something, I do research and want to know where my money is going. So, thank you. Um, and then I'd like to thank the other gentleman for actually speaking up because that was one of my points as far as the assessment, which is why I'm here. My name is Donna Berry, um, Mifflin Township. Um, my problem with the reassessment is that it's also going to raise school taxes. And in Georgia Shore, as everybody knows, I'm not sure what the taxes are everywhere else, but our taxes are through the roof right now. You know, I have to save four hundred dollars a month just to pay my taxes every year, and that's just so I don't even own my own home. You know, I might as well not even own my own home because I'm basically renting it from the school district and everything. That's ludicrous. Um, so my question is, which kind of goes back to what one of the other gentlemen was saying. Is there a way, instead of spending the money to have a reassessment, to the departments in Lycoming County work together to be able to, for example, I know two people that live not far from me that sold homes and then they, um, their taxes, when they bought their home, the new people bought their homes, never went up because it went off of the old values and for example, the one guy's values are ninety-five thousand, and he bought it for two hundred thirty-five thousand. So, isn't there a way that the departments within Lycoming County can say, okay, so it, you I can't see, do that? You know, the, the way the laws written by the state, you know, it'd be nice to have it reassessed once it was to be sold. It's the day's values, but the law doesn't permit permit that. Okay. That is a reassessment. What you're describing is the reassessment. No, that's Those spot. No, no, but what, what, it wouldn't just be done with them, but the point of reassessment is to equalize the tax burden. You, you made the statement at the beginning that, that you're concerned that it's going to raise school taxes. It won't automatically raise school taxes. School taxes are, and county taxes are a function of how much revenue is needed to pay the bills, but it redistributes the tax burden. The person who's paying taxes at a 95,000 when they pay 235 would pay taxes based on 235. I, I think, you know, when you're doing a reassessment, because you are not allowed to raise taxes in a reassessment, they allow, they allow uh, the municipalities, uh, the three taxing bodies, okay, municipalities, county, and school districts, to raise a percentage Regardless, so it, uh, I think one of them could be ten percent. The other ones are five. You know, I'm, I don't quote me on that, but and you and that's subjective. You don't have to charge that extra. You made a great comment, though. I mean, this is this is what's the problem is you have people that have uh, have assessed values that have bought along Pine Creek that live in Philadelphia, uh, a forty thousand dollars, but they pay three hundred twenty thousand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are they paying their fair share? No. Okay. And if we did a reassessment, that doesn't mean that they're going to be paying those taxes on 320000 They're going to get an assessed value, and, and the accumulation of the wealth will, will, will show up. They're not going to pay extreme taxes, and you pay nothing. Okay. It will equal it out. You know, some will... Some will pay less in taxes, some will pay more, and some will, mm -hmm. won't pay any more, all right? But what's important to know is that the longer you let it go, mm -hmm. I know that, yeah. the more, like, the, yeah. the, more the you know, lower mm -hmm. you know, values are, are paying because of the, the taxation every year. So then it, it's a matter of them taking the total values and then reducing the millage to meet that year's yeah. Well, the millage actually went down. Oh, absolutely. The millage will go down. 
It, it happens in every in the school region. districts too. Every 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 millage goes down. Okay. So to to balance that out, it's the state law. You cannot raise millage. more tax. Tax doesn't go down. Millage tax, goes down. Taxes. Millage goes down to meet the values of of the, the year before the assessment. But but that doesn't mean your taxes will go down. Right. No, because no, I didn't right. say no, no. I, I know. Say I just wanted to be sure right. you understood. So that's that's the, yeah, and they, don't they need the to get the same. I mean, they're right. That's yeah. called a spot assessment, which right. you're describing. But I guess what I was trying to say to you is that the process you're describing is the process of reassessment. It's equalizing it so the person who buys at two thirty five isn't paying taxes on ninety five, while other people are picking up the tax burden because the school district has to raise the millage to raise the same revenue, right? If that person at 235 is supposed to pay 600 and they're only paying right. 250, the it's other 450 or whatever it has to be. It's complicated. Well, yeah. I know I know a couple of, I know three people that actually moved in to the township in the Jersey Shore School District, I should say, and they literally moved after a couple of years because they said, the school taxes are ridiculous. I didn't pay that much back where I was living. Right. And so they sold their house and moved because they said, this is crazy. I can't afford this. So just big picture, part of the problem in Pennsylvania, look, we have a 3.07% income tax. It's one of the lowest in the nation. And when a governor or, or, or people in the legislature say, let's increase the income tax, everyone says, whoa, whoa, don't do that. The people who are making 35, 50,000 our senior citizens are not going to see an increase because there's a cutoff at which you don't pay state income tax. The people who are making a million dollars, three million dollars in income, they're going to see more. But the point is that if you put it all on the property tax, then you're taxing people who are least able to afford it. And so we have to get and educate people about the fact that if it's proportional, if you just raise the personal income tax and you don't do anything to the property tax, but there was a proposal by Governor Wolf to raise the personal income tax and reduce the property tax at a you know at a rate. You know, then then you actually begin to distribute the tax burden. We don't have a lot of people in our community making one or two million dollars a year. In the big cities, lawyers at the big firms have got to be starting at three or four hundred thousand dollars. I mean, they were starting at 150 30 years ago. So you have doctors, you have lawyers, you have you know. And, and a reassessment is not about raising taxes. A reassessment is putting the right values on properties. Yes. I, I know it's not to raise taxes, right. and I know exactly what you just mean. You know, what you're saying. It's just my concern is, as the gentleman said about senior citizens, for example. Right. You know, they don't. I had to help my parents pay bills. You know, and that's ridiculous. They worked all those years and they couldn't even afford their house. I had to help them so they could keep their house. And that's, so to me, a reassessment for the older people, in my opinion, is just going to hurt them even more. You know what I mean? Some, some could and some could yeah. really help. Them, yeah. So, and then the last thing, which I know you can't do anything about this either, but still about the assessment. Because of what people started in 2020, paying to build houses, okay? Because building materials went through the roof. Is there anything that can be done? Because even though, for example, I, I built my house in 2020, okay? I knew what I paid, which was a lot more than I should have had to have paid a few years before that. But now you're going to reassess me, and you're probably going to come in and say, oh, it's worth X amount more money. And then here I am going to where my parents were. How am I going to afford it? Because like I said, I'm already setting aside $400 a month now to pay my taxes. And I, so now you do a reassessment. Now I'm going to have to save maybe $600 a month. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the value are done by neighborhoods, okay, and by the, the sales of the properties, okay, not not by the materials that you you purchased to build it, okay, and the labor because you paid more in labor, mm -hmm. so it, that's just part of the equation in, during the the states the steps uh, revaluation. So um, yeah, it it is a complicated. It's 
very complicated to explain. I can't even explain it. I sat on the board. Jen, could you hold on one minute? As I have a question for not outside of questions. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, and, and if you would, were to look back at any reassessment, for the most part, unless it was up, uh, the common level ratio was going up, right, uh, you would you would see a reduction in the millage. Like, I think we were at, I don't quote me on this, but I think we were at seven mils, six mils, and it went down to four, 4.25, okay? So most of the time, you, you're going to see a reduction in the mills. Reduction in mills, but I won't see a reduction in my taxes. Correct. No, well, I, I, I can't say that. I yeah. can't say that. 5% see a This is what they say. The, the, this 5% see a reduction, 5% see an increase. Uh, in the past. I mean, no, no, a third. A third, okay. Yeah, I'm a, sorry. A mis, third, mis, you're right. They say it's a misnomer. They, they say it's a misnomer, yeah. yeah. We can't, we can't, we can't no, get We can't project. project. Yeah, we, we, we can't. Can. No, that's a good point. Yeah. We can't. But historically, is is what it is. Right. What it should do is equalize the tax. That's all it does. Burden a little better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Yes. Anybody else? One last call. Yeah. Please keep it brief in the county kind of issues. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Tom Adams, Williams Port, Romans three eighteen. There is no fear of God before their eyes, and that's what we see a lot of. Um, just a brief mention of the protest schedule for Saturday. Um, I don't. I don't see that they have a fear of God because um, Israel has got to wipe out Hamas. It's just a plain fact, and it's a sad thing. But they're not going to stop. They're going to continue, and and it is kind of a county issue because we do want to stand up for what's right. But the other thing was really want to mention, aside all the other stuff. Uh, I was at the DEP meeting last night, Department, you know, Environmental Protection, and through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, they want to know, um, get in community input from how we might want to spend funds from that act if we get the, uh, the grant funds monies for the for the county or community. I, I mentioned that, and you did have a rep there to say, tell them you have a great resource here in the county that does a good job of you know putting forward for grant monies. Now if they if you were able to get a grant, do, do you know yet is are there parameters that they tell you how you have to spend that money? Well, I would yeah. think so. There's yeah. it's big restrictions. Yeah. yeah. Well see the thing the thing is I got on the Our issue. Most. <laughs> I got on the issue last night and sure quite a few people agreed with me is that we gotta clean these forests up and if we can use that money because that will help the environment. And I know they're all about these greenhouse gases because there's no fear of God before their eyes because they don't have to tell the truth about environmental issues because the environmental issues isn't the greenhouse gases and, and all this stuff. But it is in our forests. When Tony said they did have that a couple of years ago when they cleaned that mountaintop up oh, yeah. and the canopy was great. That's what we need to do, clean these forests up Help, trees will be healthier, we'll get rid of all that nonsense, and I suggest it all gets burnt and we can use that for energy because there's a lot of disease on that stuff, a lot of insects we don't want, and it'll increase that soil. But I, I'm hoping that we could use the money, a lot of money towards that. So, thank, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we've completed our agenda, so our next meeting will be uh, December 14th, 2023, right here at this room, 10 a.m. Thank you. Can you back room real quick? Uh, it has to be public. Gotcha. Have you helped? Okay. Good luck. Uh, what are we doing? We have a work requirement. Really? Was it your kid? Yeah. <laughs>